The 3D Mario series is one of my absolute favorite series in all of gaming. From games like Super Mario 64 that defines the 3D platformer genre, to Super Mario Galaxy that completely shook up every convention the series had seen thus far in order to create one of the most original and fun 3D Mario experiences out there, there is a lot to love about this series. But at the same time, there also is a lot not to love. And in this video, I want to take an extensive look at every entry in the 3D Mario series. Yes, I mean every. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy an entire 3D Mario series retrospective. Beginning with the game that started it all. Okie dokie! To fully understand what made this game so great, and cemented it in history as one of the most important video games ever made, we have to go back. All the way back to 1993 when Star Fox for the Super Nintendo was finalizing development. Star Fox was able to achieve actual 3D graphics with the use of the Super FX ship found inside the cartridge. And after seeing this, Miyamoto started to conceive an idea for a 3D Mario game. Around the same time, Nintendo started work on their next big console that they would codename Project Reality. The goal for Project Reality was to create a console capable of running games with full 3D environments and graphics. And after learning about this, Super Mario 64 was no longer an idea that Miyamoto was conceiving, it was now becoming a reality. See what I did there? The bulk of Super Mario 64's development was spent on how Mario would control. Miyamoto wanted Mario's movement to be easy to learn the basics of, but difficult to master them and fully make use of every move. Which is the exact reason why Mario has such a wide range of moves in the game, with some of them involving multiple button presses and or analog movements to pull off like the side flip and triple jump. Instead of building Mario's movement around the levels, the team instead wanted to focus on the levels last and build them after Mario's movement was complete, so they would essentially be building the levels around how Mario would control in them, which allowed for them to be more creative with the stages and create the fun and open platforming jungle gyms we see in the finished product. Although the idea of Super Mario 64 being a 3D game was heavily inspired by Star Fox, the 3D platforming aspect was instead inspired by a 3D Yoshi game that was to be made by an outside studio, but was ultimately cancelled due to Nintendo being very protective of the characters at the time. But then a year later they let Philips release this shit. <laughs> Nice of the princess to invite us over for a picnic, eh, Luigi? I hope she made lots of spaghetti! Luigi! The iconic interactive Mario head on the title screen actually has more lore than you might think. Many sources say that the head was actually intended to be featured in a scrapped Mario Paint 3D, while others say it was made exclusively for Mario 64 to show off the power of the N64 right as the player opened the game. The interactive part of it, however, was made to familiarize the player with the N64's new analog controls, which could be pretty hard to adjust to at first. And since this game practically invented the 3D platformer genre, introducing analog controls to the player wouldn't be the only struggle the team would face. Things like stomping on a Goomba, which was incredibly easy to do in a 2D game, was a lot more difficult in a 3D environment. Trying to judge where you would land after a jump was almost impossible because of how difficult it was to understand the depth of a 3D environment while you view it from a pretty much flat TV screen. In order to combat this, Mario, along with every object, enemy, and character, was given a shadow beneath them, regardless of if it was a dark area or not, to help the player judge where they are on the screen, and more importantly, where the enemies are. And lastly, to finish up the development background of this game, I wanted to talk about Mario's animations. During early development, the team was planning on using motion capture technology to capture the different moves that Mario would do, but instead, they opted to fully animate his moves digitally. However, in order to give the team a feel for what he wanted those animations to look like, Miyamoto actually acted some of them out himself. It is very possible that the animation for moves like the single jump, double jump, long jump, and crawl came from Miyamoto jumping and crawling around the room in order to show the team what he wanted them to look like. Which is not only a little bit funny, but really shows the dedication and care he put into this game. And so after a 3 year development period spanning from 1993 to 1996, Super Mario 64 would release here in North America on September 29th, 1996 along with the N64 as a launch title, and was THE game to buy if you got an N64 on launch day. No really, it was THE game to get on launch day, because it literally was THE only game you could get here in North America. Well, other than Pilot Wings. Upon opening the game for the first time, getting to the file select, watching the opening cutscene, and seeing Mario jump out of a pipe, you're met with 
almost silence, only hearing the sound of birds chirping and the flowing water under the moat. No music pushing you to rescue the princess from the clutches of the evil Bowser. No Goomba for you to stomp on. Just the relaxing sounds of nature. It's such a beautiful way to start off the game and really makes you feel relaxed. But I mean it makes sense. Nothing that's been presented to you thus far has alluded to any urgent threat. All you know is that Peach baked a cake for Mario and invited him over to the castle to see it. From a gameplay perspective, this is absolutely genius as well. For a lot of people who played this game around the years it was released, it was probably not only the first 3D platformer they played, it was probably the first 3D game they'd ever played. The courtyard allows for us to learn how to control Mario in this game without feeling obligated to rush inside the castle because again, no threat has been presented to us thus far. The courtyard has an open area for Mario to triple jump, long jump, and side flip, trees to leap off of, a body of water to swim in, pretty much every important aspect of Mario's moveset is covered in just this one area. Well, every aspect except one. The combat. Very cleverly, the developers opt out of having something for Mario to punch, kick, or throw, as they want to introduce that later, again establishing this false sense of security to the player that there is no threat. However, once the player feels comfortable enough to progress inside the castle, the threat is immediately presented, in the form of a message from Bowser, telling Mario that no one's home and to leave the castle. Right after reading this, we can obviously tell that this is a lie, as a toad is standing right there at the entrance, ready to tell Mario about how Bowser has trapped everyone, including the princess, inside the castle, and that he needs to venture inside the paintings to collect all the power stars and defeat Bowser. And with that, the player has not only got a decent understanding of the controls and is probably partially adjusted to the 3D environment, but they know exactly what they have to do, all before even entering the first level. Peach's Castle is one of the coolest hub worlds in all of gaming. Its music is so catchy and simple that I sometimes find myself humming it as I wander around its many rooms. The castle holds so many secrets and little details that it almost feels like its own level. You have portraits and tiny holes to jump into that lead to secret levels with stars hidden in them, bunnies to catch, beams of light that transport you high into the sky, and so many different floors, all with their own distinct vibe. It really feels like a giant castle fit for a royal family to live in. I was really disappointed by Super Mario Odyssey's Peach's Castle that just only had one room. We really haven't seen the castle this detailed since it debuted in this game. The castle is probably one of the most iconic parts of this entire game, and is the first thing I think of when this game is mentioned, and plays a huge part in the legacy of it. But jumping into the levels themselves, see what I did there? This is where Mario's moment really starts to shine. The very first level, bob on Battlefield, is this giant sandbox full of objects and enemies for Mario to throw, punch, and stomp, all backed with its iconic music that just makes you feel free. I mean, yeah, you were told to go venture to the top of the mountain and defeat King bob -omb, but there is no linear path forcing you to go there. And furthermore, you don't even have to! Even though you selected a specific mission, you could still go for other stars like behind Chain Chomp's Gate or the 8 Red Coin mission. And if you find a star too difficult, you can just go for another one. There are 120 stars in total, however, to unlock the final level, you only need 70. Allowing players to skip stars, and even entire levels at times, is the reason that this is one of the most replayable video games of all time. You can beat it in so many different ways. And I think this freedom of being able to beat the game however you want heavily encourages speedrunning of this game, which I will talk a lot about later. Womp's Fortress is my favorite stage in the entire game. The level rewards mastery of Mario's movement like no other. If you put in enough effort, you can easily blaze through this stage and collect every single star in a matter of minutes. The first mission here, Chip Off Womp's Block, sees you scaling to the top of the fortress, avoiding enemies and waiting for platforms to move. However, with the use of a well-timed triple jump or side flip in combination with a wall jump and dive, you can skip all of that and be at the top of the fortress in seconds. And this sentiment holds true for pretty much every mission here. Instead of taking the cannon to this star, you could just side flip and wall jump up here fast. And on this star, instead of waiting for the owl, you can form a well-timed triple jump and wall jump to get into the cage that way. Experimenting with the movement and being able to complete stars in a variety of different ways was one of the big things Miyamoto wanted the player to do. He wanted you to come up with your own solutions and be able to test them on the spot, and he wanted you to explore the levels at your own pace, whether that pace be slow and calculated or fast and well-timed. At some point during very early development, there was an idea to have the game be played somewhat like a 2D Mario game, where the levels would be linear with not a lot of 3D area to move around in. But this idea was quickly scrapped, as Miyamoto believed this wouldn't be ambitious enough. However, a lot of the DNA of this idea can be seen in the Bowser levels. 
Each one is a very linear platforming gauntlet meant to test the player's abilities before they face Bowser. These levels are a lot of fun to find skips in and try to get to the goal as fast as you can. Very similar to how fun it is to blaze through a 2D Mario level. These linear levels fit well for them being a road to Bowser, but I am so glad they didn't decide to make the entire game like this because it wouldn't nearly be as impactful and important. The actual fights with Bowser himself are incredible. It will never not be fun to just grab Bowser by the tail and spin the control stick as fast as you can before finally sending him flying into the air while Mario says his iconic line assuming the sexuality of Bowser. I love how you have to partially time your throw so Bowser will hit the explosive spike ball thingies because it just adds that little bit of strategy that makes speedrunning the level so much more satisfying. Hitting perfect throws on the last stage where you have to make him hit the bombs three times is one of the most satisfying things you can do in this game. And since I mentioned Mario's iconic voice line he says after throwing Bowser, why don't we talk about Mario's voice? Super Mario 64 was the first Mario game to feature a voice for Mario, and his voice actor was none other than the incredibly iconic and well-known Chris Pratt. Oh, sorry, 25 years too early. Charles Martinet. Now this game wasn't actually Charles' debut as Mario. He actually had voiced the plumber one time before in the 1992 Super Mario Pinball Machine. I'm a super now for some reason, but had his first game debut in Super Mario 64. While Mario doesn't speak full sentences too often, he does make sounds when performing almost all of his moves. These little sounds add a lot of charm to the game and make the character feel so much more alive and would become a staple of every 3D Mario game to come. But Mario having a voice wouldn't be the only thing the player would hear. As I touched on before briefly with Peach's Castle and bob on Battlefield, this game's soundtrack is absolutely fantastic. Even from the moment you start the game and are on the title screen, you have this wonderful track that is just beaming with excitement, ready to get you in the game. And once you move on to the file select, it moves to this beautiful slower track that is almost soothing in a sense. And then you have the tracks that play for the different levels in the game. Cool Cool Mountain has this festive and blissful track that is a perfect fit for the level's Winter Wonderland vibe. But then you have the theme of Dire Dire Docks. It's incredibly slow and peaceful. It's a song you could easily fall asleep to. It's soothing and calm. It doesn't push you forward, rather holds you back in a sense. It encourages the player to slow down and take in the sights, and is one of my favorite tracks in the entire franchise. Bowser's Road. The theme that plays throughout every Bowser stage in the game. This track just has that Bowser energy, and I would not be surprised if we see a rendition of it play during the Super Mario Bros. movie Illumination is working on. It would be perfect for a scene of Bowser's troops marching into battle. The soundtrack of Super Mario 64 is one of the most iconic in gaming history, thanks to the work of the legendary Koji Kondo. Each and every track brings the world of this game to life, and while I'm nowhere close to familiar with how music composition works, I can still appreciate the soundtrack for how incredible it is. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Soundtracks are one of the most important parts of a video game, not only because of the emotions they can convey, but the memories they can hold. Every time I listen to this game's OST, I'm able to partially relive and remember some of my favorite moments with it. And whether that be remembering the pure on excitement I felt in my first time romping through bob on Battlefield, or the mystical wonder I felt in the soothing atmosphere of Jolly Roger Bay, Super Mario 64 soundtrack will always be there to remind me of the memories I hold within this polygonal world. The OST of this game without a doubt set the stage for how a 3D platformer could sound, furthermore showing the strong legacy of this game. The Mario series has long been known for its creativity, and no other game exemplifies this sentiment better than Super Mario 64. Not only are the levels creative, but so are the missions, and the characters. bob -omb Battlefield is this giant war zone where the bob -omb buddies are fighting against the evil bob in a massive turf war. Leading the evil bob -omb is the giant King bob -omb, who has long ruled over the land and recently became even stronger with the star that Bowser entrusted to him. We see cannons spread all throughout the battlefield that both sides make use of to launch projectiles at each other. In Cool Cool Mountain, you have to carefully escort this small baby penguin all the way down the mountain to reunite it with its mother, and maybe throw it off the edge after she gives you the star. In Jolly Roger Bay, you venture into a abandoned sunken ship deep below the sea and drain the water out of it so it can once again float atop the sea. 
A lot of the missions and locations in Super Mario 64 can leave it up to the player to use their imagination to form their own story of why certain things are the way that they are in these worlds. Why were the bob bombs at war? Whose ship sank in Jolly Roger Bay? Who used to live in the underwater city found in Wet Dry World? These worlds are not only fun to explore and complete objectives in, they're fun to theorize about and they feel alive. Many games today are unable to replicate that sense of imagination that Super Mario 64 so vividly conveys. I remember watching my brother play this game when I was really young, before I myself even played it, and how badly I wanted to play along with him because of how imaginative the world looked. And if it weren't for some of the limitations of the N64, I probably would have been able to. According to Miyamoto in an interview from 1996, the year the game came out, Luigi was originally supposed to be in the game as a playable character alongside Mario. You would have been able to plug in two N64 controllers and play through the entire game with a friend. However, due to memory issues and the N64's heavy limitations, he had to be cut very late into development. But even after this interview, many still believe that Luigi was hidden somewhere in the game due to this one pixely texture that seemed to read out the sentence, L is real, 2401. So many people interpreted this sentence in so many different ways. Many thought it meant you had to do 2401 of something to unlock Luigi, collect 2401 coins, walk around the star statue 2401 times, beat Bowser's scrawny Koopa ass 2401 times. Others went a little deeper though, connecting the numbers of 2401 to the release date of Paper Mario on the N64. That game released on February 4th, 2001, and when you write that date on in numbers, you get 2 representing the February, 4 representing the 4th, and 01 representing 2001, coming all together to form the iconic 2401. I remember spending hours looking up online theories about Luigi and all the different ways to unlock him, and wondering to myself if he really was in the game. This one rumor alone is a huge part of the game's legacy, and it's something almost anyone who's ever even heard of the game knows about. And although talk on the L is real 2401 rumor died out in the 2010s, this wouldn't be the end of the infamous Luigi and Mario 64 saga. On July 25th, 2020, a massive Nintendo data leak took place, and within this data leak was a portion of Mario 64's source code. After scouring this code, people found that there was parts of an unused model scattered all around the leaked code. And once they were able to put everything together, 24 years and exactly one month after Mario 64's release in Japan, coming all together to form the iconic 2401, L was real. The model for Luigi was found. The debate of if Luigi was really in Super Mario 64 had finally come to an end. It was incredible. All thanks to a group of very talented people coming together to leak this code and then put together this model. And illegally breaching Nintendo servers wasn't the only time a group of talented people had come together to keep this game's legacy as strong as ever. Almost immediately after its release, Super Mario 64 became an incredibly popular game to speedrun. There were so many different ways to complete it that finding an optimal route could lead you beating the game incredibly fast. And combine this with the game's incredible movement options, broken tricks like the backwards long jump, and passionate community, Super Mario 64 didn't only become one of the most fun games to speedrun of all time, it became one of the most popular and active speedrunning communities ever. To this day, Super Mario 64 sits at the top of the speedrun.com leaderboard as the game with the second most runs submitted to date clocking in at a total of 32,928 recorded runs, only getting beaten out by Subway Surfers because of a TikTok trend. And I mean, it isn't even a speedrun. The goal of it isn't to go fast, it's actually to survive as long as possible. So it's less of a speedrun and more of a, a survive run? I don't know. But what I do know is that Super Mario 64 speedrunning community has kept the game alive long after it would have died out. Speedrunners like Ouija, Cheese, Simply, and Suiji continue to push this game to its absolute limits and show just how much effort was put into Mario's movement alone. Watching these runners pull off insane tricks and being able to complete the game faster than you would ever think it could be completed is incredibly satisfying, and I will always love tuning into a runner's stream just to see them play the game. Super Mario 64 is one of the most important games ever made. It not only redefined the platforming genre, but it created the framework for how modern 3D games should be made. Its non-linear progression and decision to let the player complete the game in any way they see fit makes it an infinitely replayable masterpiece. It's hard to get bored of this game. Its soundtrack perfectly sets the atmosphere for the different worlds you explore. 
It has the ability to make you feel emotion. These tracks hold memories that you will carry for the rest of your life. Urban legends like L is Real and the rumor of a playable Luigi kept discussion of the game alive late into the 2000s. And the popularization of speedrunning brought the spotlight back on the game and has helped it maintain its popularity for decades. Super Mario 64 is not a perfect game, and it doesn't have to be. The impact this game had on the industry, and just people's lives in general, more than enough makes up for some of its minor shortcomings. The legacy of Super Mario 64 will never be forgotten. Released on August 26, 2002 here in North America, Super Mario Sunshine is the second entry in the 3D Mario series, but initially was not supposed to be. You see, after the immense success of Super Mario 64 and the N64, being the best-selling game on the system by a pretty decent margin, a sequel to the game was a no-brainer to Nintendo. At first, series director Shigeru Miyamoto planned to have the game developed for the 64DD an add-on for the N64 that connected to the bottom of the system and allowed the console to read floppy disks that could hold significantly more storage on them than N64 cartridges could. But due to the failure and subsequent discontinuation of the add-on, development for the game was put on hold. And for the next few years, Mimoto would continue to reassure fans that a sequel to Super Mario 64 was coming, just not on the N64. But as time went on and the launch of their upcoming console, the GameCube, drew closer, Nintendo became more and more doubtful of Miyamoto's Super Mario 64 sequel. So in a last ditch effort to have a 3D Mario game release in the next few years, in late 2000, Nintendo very hastily began development on what would eventually, over an incredibly short development period of around 18 months, become Super Mario Sunshine. Before I talk about the game itself, I think it's pretty important to cover the opening plot of the game, as Sunshine is the very first 3D Mario game to attempt to have a fully fleshed out narrative. The game introduces its plots throughout its various opening cutscenes. The first cutscene showcases Mario, Peach, and a brand new character Toadsworth traveling through the air in a plane. Aboard this plane, the three watch a video that shows off the tropical island they're traveling to, Isle Delfino. While watching this video, Peach seems to notice an odd shadowy figure in the background of one of the shots. Peach tries to point this out to Mario and Toadsworth, but they are gone. After a rough landing, the player gets to take control of Mario and get a feel for how he moves around and controls in the game. During this brief period of being able to move around with Mario, you also get a bit of time to get acquainted with his new companion Flood, which you have to use in order to defeat this piranha made out of what Toad can only describe as... After the Piranha's defeat, Mario is arrested and put on trial for defacing and polluting Isle Delfino with the previously mentioned icky paint-like goop. Mario is unable to defend himself in court due to whatever kind of legal system they got going on in Isle Delfino, and is tasked with cleaning up the entire island before he can leave. Almost immediately after beginning his cleanup, Mario comes face to face with the shadowy figure that Peach saw in the video. This shadowy figure, very appropriately named Shadow Mario, jumps down and grabs Peach. This prompts Mario to chase after him, spraying him with water to try and defeat him. And after being bested by Mario and his new friend Flood, Shadow Mario drops Peach and retreats by making a portal on this giant Pianta statue. Heading into this portal leads to the very first level of the game, Bianco Hills. I absolutely love this opening for so many different reasons. I mean, first off, the whole plot revolving around Mario going to a tropical island and getting framed for crimes he obviously didn't commit, and his goal being to clear his name, is such a breath of fresh air from the usual, oh, Peach is kidnapped and you gotta save her trope we're so used to. And yeah, I know she does get kidnapped later, but at least there's a build up to it. The full voice acting present in the cutscenes here are hilarious. I don't know if it was intentional to have the voice acting be this funny. Behold this sketch of the perpetrator based on eyewitness descriptions. 
The truth is obvious. The guilty party sits among us. But it absolutely lends to the more silly and laid-back tone Sunshine has. Finally, the way the game introduces the controls to the player is absolutely genius. From the very moment you start controlling Mario on the airstrip, there's a threat present. That being the goop. This immediately has the player engaged and gets them right into the action. The next time you gain control of Mario is during your chase with Shadow Mario. During this chase, the player has only the basic knowledge of Mario's controls, but through being forced to chase Shadow Mario, they will most likely be able to grasp the controls even quicker. And it's not like this chase is unfair or anything. If you don't move quick enough, Shadow Mario does stop and wait for you. But it's the illusion of this chase being more than what it is that will help players. The whole opening sequence is an amazing way to engage players at the start without being too overwhelming. Moving on from the opening, we have the incredible hub world that is Delfino Plaza. I have, and I am not even joking when I say this, spent hours just running around this place over the years. There's just so much to do here. I mean, you got the various amount of secret shines hidden all about, the 20 blue coins spread around, and the many NPCs to talk to that have some great dialogue. What I always loved about this place, though, was its secrets. I mean, with the amount of shines and blue coins you find here, Delfino Plaza is practically its own entire level. Some of the shines here are quite simple, like this one where you just spray flood in the sand, but others get a bit more interesting. For example, you have these two shines that you're rewarded by winning this crate minigame twice, this one that involves cleaning these two bell towers, another that has you finding and spraying a golden bird, one that requires bashing into this gate with the turbo nozzle to reveal a hidden shine inside, and so many more. Along with the shines and secrets, the music of Delfino Plaza is just so good. I could listen to it for hours. Delfino Plaza is an almost perfect hub world, and is up there with Peach's Castle and the Comet Observatory as one of my favorite video game hub worlds. But even years after finding and collecting all its secrets and goodies, there's one thing that still kept me running and jumping around this place for hours. The movement. Super Mario Sunshine's movement is practically flawless. I'd say the only 3D Mario that's been able to one-up it has been Odyssey. But that's only because Odyssey expanded upon and refined what made Mario's movement so amazing in this game. The introduction of the spin and the changes to the dive were such great additions to Mario's moveset. The controls here are tight and precise. I rarely felt like a mistake I made was the fault of the game's movement. The introduction of Flood only adds to what makes the movement so fun here as well. The one thing I always felt was missing from 64 was a mid-air correction tool you see in every other 3D Mario game. Flood's Hover Nozzle is a perfect mid-air correction tool that always saves me when I make a mistake in my inputs. Along with that, the Hover Nozzle also just makes it that much more enjoyable to pull off crazy tricks and skips that assist in completing shines faster. The one thing I always see people complaining about though in regards to Sunshine's movement is the lack of the long jump. But I mean with Flood's Hover Nozzle, there is literally no need for a long jump, as the Hover Nozzle can cover much more distance than that of the long jump. There's only one place I can think of in the game that would benefit from Mario having a long jump, and that's in the secret stages. In every single main level of Super Mario Sunshine, there is at least one secret stage that the player has to complete in order to beat the game. Upon entering one of the many secret stages, Flood will be taken away from you by Shadow Mario, forcing you to platform through the entirety of the stage without having the ability to hover through the air with ease. The secret stages are one of my absolute favorite parts of the game. Sometimes. I love how these stages force players to get more familiar with Mario's other moves, rather than just sticking with the hover nozzle and Mario's basic moves like the triple jump and wall jump. The secret stages are what taught me just how powerful moves like the spin and dive were. And because of that, I started using these moves more outside of the secret stages. And in turn, I was able to better grasp and understand the complexity of Mario's moveset. These secret stages aren't perfect though. Some of them tend to be designed in a more unfair way. I'm looking at you, Chuckster Stage. But overall, the majority of them are designed pretty fairly, and I've always looked forward to these stages when I replay the game. Outside of the secret stages though, we have the actual stages of the game, of which there are seven. These seven stages include Bianco Hills, Rico Harbor, Gelato Beach, Pina Park, Serena Beach, Noki Bay, and Pianta Village. 
Now the decrease from Mario 64's 15 stages to Sunshine's 7 stages may seem like a big downgrade, but it's actually not. The seven main stages of Sunshine have so much to offer in them. For starters, where Super Mario 64 has 7 stars in each stage, Sunshine has 10 in each of its stages. Furthermore, Sunshine's stages are much larger than 64's, and because of that are, in some ways, more fun to explore. By saying all this, I'm not at all trying to say Sunshine is better than 64 in any way. Rather that Sunshine is often referred to as a major downgrade to 64 in terms of levels, when that actually isn't entirely the case. One of the things I love most about Sunshine's stages, though, is their theming. Since all of Sunshine's levels take place on Isle Delfino, a tropical island, all of them are designed and built around this tropical summer theme. A lot of people argue that this theme being consistent throughout the entire game is to Sunshine's detriment, and that it gets repetitive and boring, but I would argue that that is absolutely not the case. The consistent theming is immersive, it makes the island more believable and real. I mean, you got locations like Gelato Beach, a sun-soaked beach with a beautiful coral reef. Rico Harbor, a rich trading port filled with boats and cranes that carry around goods. Pina Park, a giant amusement park found on an island just off the coast of Isle Delfino that's full of so many different attractions for guests to ride on. All of these locations feel like actual places that tourists would want to travel to in real life. But by far the biggest strength of Mario Sunshine stages, and the main thing that makes them so immersive in the first place, is their connectivity. By connectivity, I mean how, in the simplest sense, every single level in the game is connected. I already mentioned how every one takes place on a different part of Isle Delfino, but what I didn't mention is that, in almost every single level, you can see other locations and stages far off in the distance. For example, from Bianco Hills, you can spot places like Delfino Plaza, Rico Harbor, and Pina Park far off in the distance. And likewise, from Pina Park, you can see all those previously mentioned locations, plus Serena Beach and Gelato Beach. I always loved heading to different stages in the game and seeing what landmarks I could spot far off in the distance, and seeing if I could get a new perspective on these places, because it was just another way to get immersed in the wonder of Al Delfino. If Nintendo for whatever reason ever decides to remake Super Mario Sunshine or return to Al Delfino, I would love for it to be completely open world. Just imagine instead of just being able to see locations in the distance, you could just go there without having to jump into portals or return to a hub world. It would be amazing. But despite all the great things I've praised Sunshine for, the game is absolutely not without its fair share of flaws. I mean, it's pretty well known at this point that Super Mario Sunshine was rushed out to try and save the GameCube after its rocky launch as evident by its extremely short development period of around 18 months. So with this short development period, there was bound to be some corners cut in some aspects. For starters, you have the fact that, in order to unlock the final stage, Corona Mountain, and be able to complete the game, the player has to collect the first seven shines in each main level. This essentially means that regardless of if you get stuck on a shine or find it annoying, if it's on episode one through seven of a level, you have to complete it. The plot reason for this is because the seventh shine of each stage is a Shadow Mario chase, and in order to get Shadow Mario to flee to Corona Mountain and unlock it, he has to be defeated in every single stage. Regardless of the plot reasons for it though, this seven shine requirement is so annoying. In 64, if you found a star too hard or too cryptic, you could just skip it. I mean, of the 120 stars in the game, you only needed 70 to unlock the final Bowser level. So why couldn't Sunshine do something similar to this? There were so many instances on my first playthrough of the game where I just didn't want to do a certain shine. But if I wanted to move on and make any sort of progress in the game, I would have to do it. Of all the required shines in the game though, no one was more infuriating than Gelato Beach's episode 4 shine, The Sandbird is Born. The Sandbird shine is infamous for its unfair design and overall just frustrating nature. The mission sees the player riding on top of a group of flying blocks of sand in the shape of a bird. On the bird lay seven red coins that the player must collect, with the eighth and final red coin sat at the top of the tower the sandbird is flying around. Doesn't seem too bad, right? Wrong. 
As the Sandbird starts to get closer and closer to the top of the tower, for some godforsaken reason, this thing decides to rotate itself 90 degrees to the side. While it's turning, the player has to quickly adjust themselves to be on a part of the Sandbird that will be safe. But this is difficult because of how slippery and clunky the sand is, and leads to you falling off incredibly easily. And while the Sandbird is an annoying required shine, there are many other shines that aren't required to beat the game, but are just as, and in some cases, even more annoying than the Sandbird. I mean, you got shines like the infamous Pachinko Machine that will fling you wherever it wants, the Watermelon Shine on Gelato Beach that'll make you despise the Cataquacks, and finally, the lily pad ride. The other main annoying aspect of Sunshine is its blue coins. Spread throughout every main stage of the game are 30 blue coins for the player to collect. These blue coins are scattered across different episodes of levels, and upon collecting 10 of them, you're able to turn them into this house in Rico Harbor to net yourself a shine. Because a pretty big amount of them are really cryptic, it's incredibly difficult to track down all 240 of them without a guide. And even with the help of a guide, finding them will take hours. Sunshine's annoying aspects really hold back the game in a lot of ways. There are so many areas in this game that are very clearly rushed, and it honestly hurts to see all the missed potential in some of these areas. Moving on, the last main thing I want to talk about here is the final level and boss fight of the game. After defeating Shadow Mario in all seven main levels, he quickly flees away to the top of Corona Mountain where he's keeping Peach, who he kidnaps once the player makes their way to Pina Park, where he also reveals his true identity as Bowser Jr., a brand new character introduced in Sunshine. Upon making your way into Corona Mountain, you're met with a linear platforming gauntlet that you have to make your way through in order to reach the top. There are three main sections to Corona Mountain. The first sees you do some simple platforming across fiery and spiky blocks. The next sees you guiding a boat across a lava lake whilst trying to avoid crashing into obstacles. And the final section sees you using the rocket nozzle to propel yourself, literally, into the clouds. I don't know if this is a controversial opinion or not, but I actually enjoy Corona Mountain as a final level. I always love guiding the boat through the lava lake, because I've always thought it was a really cool use of the spray nozzle. I have heard some criticism towards this lava lake section, as some believe it to be just as finicky and clunky as guiding the lily pad in the lily pad ride, but honestly I'd have to disagree. The lava lake section and just boat controls in general are much more forgiving than the torture that is the lily pad stage. Moving past that though, we have the final boss battle of Sunshine, where the one and only Bowser makes his first appearance in the game, and uh, he talks. <laughs> My family vacation. I think they should get Jack Black to recite Bowser's lines here. It would be legendary. This final Bowser fight involves destroying the five large marked X's surrounding Bowser's, uh, hot tub. In order to do this, the player must use the rocket nozzle to propel Mario high enough into the air so that he can perform an extra powerful ground pound that will be able to destroy the X's. This final fight is fine. It just feels like there could have been so much more to it. I mean, just look at the Mecha Bowser fight in Pina Park. This fight is hands down one of the coolest fights in a 3D Mario game. You're on a roller coaster and you gotta shoot missiles at this giant robot Bowser while it shoots its own missiles at you and breathes fire. It's just full of the creativity and personality I associate this game with. Hitting that final X and watching as Bowser's bathtub flips over and sends everyone free falling into the clouds isn't as satisfying as other 3D Mario final bosses, but definitely still a lot of fun. Released on November 21st, 2004, here in North America, Super Mario 64 DS was Nintendo's big launch title for the DS. And, very interestingly, it wasn't even initially called Super Mario 64 DS. As I mentioned before, at Nintendo's E3 2004 press conference, 
They showed off what very well seemed to be Super Mario 64 running on an actual DS. Featuring three new playable characters, Luigi, Wario, and Yoshi as evident from the icons on the touchscreen. But what I didn't mention was the playable prototype version of the game available on the E3 2004 show floor. From the very limited amount of footage there is available online showcasing this demo, and the very few accounts from the people who were able to play it, we can gather that Super Mario 64 DS was originally called Super Mario 64 4 and that it seemed to be an almost exclusively multiplayer game, where the goal was to run around a select amount of recreated levels and compete with others to collect a certain amount of stars in a time limit. Pretty much identical to the versus mode we see in the final version of the game, but a little more fleshed out and complete almost as if it was supposed to be the entire game. There was a single player mode available though too, albeit very limited. In this single player mode, you got 60 seconds to run around either bob -um Battlefield or the outside of Peach's Castle, and just kinda mess around. Seeing the game in this state is very interesting, and really makes you wonder if it was even supposed to be a remake in the first place. Upon opening the game, you're greeted with a title screen pretty similar to that of the original Mario 64's, but now DSified. You got the settings option, versus mode, adventure, rec room, and of course Mario's big fat head in the center of the screen. Clicking this head results in Mario turning into a drawing that you can either play around with, or what I prefer doing, using the touchscreen to draw your own beautiful rendition of Mario. Fun fact about this little drawing feature, if you repeatedly click then go back to the menu, instead of getting a Mario drawing or Yoshi, you'll instead get a little drawing of Luigi. This is such a minor little easter egg, but I absolutely love it. Getting to the adventure mode though, Super Mario 64 DS opens with a very different cutscene than that of the original. Of course Peach has still baked a cake for Mario and invited him over to eat it, but now joining him out of the pipe are two of the new playable characters, Luigi and Wario. After a bit of fighting, the gang make their way up to the castle, but never seem to leave. Because of this, Lakitu alerts a sleeping Yoshi to wake up and go find the three. Having the player start off with Yoshi, and hell, having Yoshi be a playable character in the first place, is something I've always loved about this game. Yoshi works so well in 3D here. I mean you got his flutter jump that serves as a great way to cross gaps or hold your place in the air for a while and his tongue attack that allows him to eat and spit out enemies, or turn them into eggs that, when you shoot them, home in on the nearest enemy. Yoshi's moveset and special abilities are so fun to mess around with in levels, and really makes me hope we get to someday see him fully playable again in a 3D Mario game. The closest we've gotten in recent years is him being capturable in Odyssey. Since you start off as Yoshi, a character who's unable to pick up and throw things like Mario, the first star of the game, the fight with King bob -omb, is much different. The fight now sees King bob -omb throwing bob -omb's at Yoshi that Yoshi has to eat up and spit back at the king before they explode in his mouth. The game having this many differences so early into its runtime is absolutely enough to make you realize that Super Mario 64 DS isn't exactly a faithful remake of the N64 game with some new characters. It's an entire reimagining of the game with huge changes to stages, missions, and boss fights that to me really help it stand on its own as an entirely different experience. Speaking of huge changes that help this game stand on its own, just look at the renovation this room got in 64DS. Now instead of just being a tiny room with the same painting plastered on the walls three times, it's a gigantic room that holds four locked doors. Three of the locked doors here are for the three unlockable characters in the game. But that white door? I mean, there could be anything in there. In order to unlock the three character doors so you're not stuck as this dinosaur the entire time, you have to find each of their portraits hidden around different areas of the castle. Or in Luigi's case, stuck in King Boo's attic. Inside of these portraits lie entirely new levels, even with a couple power stars to collect in them. And while these new levels are fun to mess around in for a bit, the highlight of these portrait stages have to be the boss fights. The fights here are completely unique to 64DS, and are a lot of fun. The boss in Mario's portrait is against the one and only Goom Boss from Paper Mario 64, who, fun fact, is the only Paper Mario character to appear in a mainline Mario game. The boss in Luigi's portrait is against King Boo from the Luigi's Mansion series, 
who, in order to defeat, has the player use the reflection of a mirror to tell where he is on screen. Finally, the boss in Wario's portrait has you go up against Chief Chili, a completely original boss enemy. Having the player unlock these characters in a unique way like this, instead of just having them be unlocked by having a certain amount of stars, is something I've always appreciated about 64DS. It's just another way the game shows its creativity. And I mean, 64DS doesn't just show creativity with the way you unlock these characters, it also shows creativity with how these characters control. I've already touched on how Yoshi controls, so let's move on to Mario. Mario has the exact same moveset he had in the original game, except now his wall jump has a slide to it, whereas in the original you had to time your wall jumps when Mario would collide with the wall. What makes Mario so special here is that he is the only character in the game capable of wall jumping, making him vital in certain situations. Moving on to Luigi, he has a very similar moveset to that of Mario's, but can jump much higher, is able to run on water for a short amount of time, and most importantly, can do this. This twirl Luigi does after a backflip is extremely overpowered. There were so many scenarios in the original game that were so tedious, like slowly waiting for the penguin across the ice bridge in Snowman's Land, or in Tall Tall Mountain, finding the pink bob -bomb to open up a cannon, then carefully shimming your way across this ledge towards the cannon, and finally lining up your shot perfectly so you land on the star. That Luigi can just effortlessly complete with a single twirl. Seriously, Luigi's twirl is so broken that the star Mario's Super Wall Kick in Cool Cool Mountain, a star that is clearly meant to be collected by Mario using his wall jumping abilities, can effortlessly be collected by Luigi by performing a simple twirl. It's insane. Moving on to the last and definitely least of the four playable characters, we have Wario. Wario has literally the exact same moveset as Mario, except he's much slower, can't jump very high, and obviously can't wall jump. Wario tries to make up for this with his strength, being the only character in the game able to destroy these black bricks, but that just makes him incredibly situational and incredibly unviable. Apart from Wario, I can absolutely understand maining any of the other characters as they all definitely do have their strengths, but for me, Luigi will always be my boy. Yeah. The custom movement abilities weren't the only thing that made these characters distinct though. Each one also has a completely unique power flower ability that helps you collect certain stars or find secrets hidden about. These power flower abilities not only repurpose the power of the caps from Super Mario 64, like with Luigi's vanish ability and Wario's metal power, they also introduced entirely new abilities to the game like Balloon Mario and Fire Breathing Yoshi. Along with this, instead of having to unlock each power individually like in the N64 version, you get them all at once after hitting the big red switch and Mario Wings to the Sky, which makes repeat playthroughs of the game a lot less tedious. To use these power flower abilities and levels, you have to break open these red question mark boxes spread throughout every stage, similar to the red, green, and blue ones you'd find in the N64 version. Mario is the only character in the game to have two abilities one being the wing cap power he gets from specific levels from the feather, and the other being the balloon power he gets from the power flower. Personally, I think the power-ups are done much better in 64DS than the original, as in this game, the boxes are more prevalent in levels, and because of each character having a different power they get from the boxes, they aren't just situational anymore. For example, to some, Luigi being able to use his vanish ability in bob on Battlefield would seem absolutely useless, but to someone younger or less experienced who's struggling on the Chain Chomp Star because of, I don't know, the controls? Luigi being invincible here so the Chain Chomp can't damage them would help them complete the star much more easily. This small change is one of many little changes that make this game feel like a more complete and accessible package. A change that doesn't make this game feel like a more complete and accessible package though, is the controls. If you've ever played Super Mario 64 DS before, you knew this was coming. But when looking back at this game, especially when discussing if it's a good remake or not, the controls of it cannot be ignored. Super Mario 64 on the N64 was designed around full 360 degree movement, meaning that the player could move around in a bunch of different directions, and that objects and platforms could also be placed in a bunch of different directions as well. And that gameplay wouldn't be affected if a certain platform was placed in a certain way. Now this spells problems for the DS remake because of one thing. Well, the lack of one thing. 
analog controls. The Nintendo DS, despite being marketed as a console capable of full 3D graphics, lacks the analog control stick that made controlling most 3D games, especially 3D platformers, much easier, and instead only had a directional pad, capable at most of going in 8 directions. Meaning that in a 3D space, instead of having 360 degrees of movement, you only had 8. This loss of hundreds of degrees of movement makes controlling your character very difficult at times. There were multiple occasions where I'd want to go in a very specific direction, but since I could only move 8 ways, I would completely miss where I wanted to go and would have to sit there realigning myself. The game tries to work around this by allowing full 360 degree movement if you control the game with your finger or stylus on the touchscreen, but playing like this is incredibly awkward and does not feel right at all. The only time it feels even mildly natural is when you're swinging Bowser, where I actually prefer using the touchscreen. If you play this on a 3DS or Wii U through the Virtual Console, you'll be able to play the game with either the 3DS's circle pad or the Wii U's analog control stick. And at first, I thought this would make controlling the game much more bearable. But oh boy was I wrong. You see, since the game was never built with analog controls in mind, when you play this on a control stick, the game simply just maps the functionality of the D-pad to the control stick or circle pad, meaning you still only have 8 directions of movement. The reason Super Mario 64 was so fun in the first place was because of how seamless and fun it was to control. I used to spend hours playing the N64 version just messing around with the movement, and over subsequent playthroughs, I started to create cool movement tech that allowed me to collect a star in a faster, impressive way. So the DS remake having such a big problem with its controls really holds the game back. But I mean, it's not like they didn't try to make the controls manageable. There are different control options you can switch to in the settings that may work for some, but to me, they always just felt awkward and unnatural. The controls are without a doubt the biggest reason why many discount this game and see it as a downgrade of the original. But really, Super Mario 64 DS has so much more content to offer than that of the original. I mean, even outside of the increase from 120 stars to 150 stars in the adventure mode, the inclusion of multiple new stages, and each main level now having 8 stars instead of 7, Super Mario 64 DS also has two huge side modes that add hours to the experience, with my personal favorite of the two being the minigames. Mario 64 DS's minigames were, well, minigames that you could unlock by catching character-specific bunnies hidden all around the castle. These bunnies would appear after you collected a certain amount of stars, and depending on the character who caught them, would unlock minigames for that specific character. For example, Yoshi has minigames like the Loves Me, Loves Me Not game, Wanted, and this Wiggler game that my 7-year-old brain could never understand. Mario has minigames like this Koopa Shell bowling game, Sword Explode, and this one where you had to make him jump on a shy guy. Wario's got stuff like Snowball Roll, this one where you shoot bob bombs out of the sky, and one where you try to land a spiny shell on a Lakitu's Koopa Shell. Out of all the minigame categories here though, Luigi's had to be the best one. Luigi's minigames were all about gambling. Each one focused on you betting coins on something. My personal favorite of all the games here was Luigi Jack which is, uh, literally just Blackjack. The fun thing about Luigi's minigames is that instead of going for a high score like you do in the others, here your goal is to rack up as many coins as you possibly can, with the coin count you've achieved being saved even after you exit a game. My goal when I was younger was always to max out the coin counter in Luigi Jack, which I think I actually did at some point. The minigames of Super Mario 64 DS, especially Luigi's, add hours of fun to the experience and really makes 64DS feel like a complete package. I've said this before in regards to New Super Mario Bros. DS bringing back these minigames, but there's so much to do here that I'm honestly surprised Nintendo never sold a minigame collection separately on the DS. I would have loved it. Moving on to the other side mode of this game, we have the Versus mode. By connecting to a host using the DS's download play feature, three players who didn't even have to own the game were able to participate in this up to four player brawl to collect the most stars. In the waiting room, you got the choice between four stages, the Castle Grounds, Sunshine Isles, the Princess's Secret Slide, and Battle Fort. 
Two of the four stages here, Sunshine Isles and Battlefort, are completely new stages exclusive to Super Mario 64 DS that can also be accessed in the adventure mode as well. In this versus mode, each player plays as a certain color Yoshi, and with the use of character caps scattered all throughout the stages, the Yoshis can transform into Mario, Luigi, or Wario, and use their abilities to help them nab the most stars. I didn't play this mode that much, but when I did, I had a lot of fun with it. It's very simple at its core, but honestly that's what makes it so fun. You could play this with just about anyone, and they'd be able to quickly understand what they had to do and have a good time with it. The last main thing I want to talk about here are the Bowser levels and Bowser fights. The big thing you'll immediately realize when you try to do a Bowser level is that you can only challenge him as Mario. Which I mean yeah, makes sense, but I would have loved to take on these levels with the other characters. It would have been so cool if each character had a unique way they fought Bowser. And in the final fight, you got to switch between all four characters throughout a multi-stage fight that would end with Mario swinging him by the tail and throwing him into a spike bomb. I can absolutely understand why they didn't do this though, as a change like this might have been too different from the source material, but I still think it's a cool idea. What we do have in the Bowser levels and fights here though, is still a lot of fun. While you probably will have problems in regards to platforming through these levels because of the controls, since these levels are so linear and a lot of the time just a straight line with multiple levels, it's not too bad. The Bowser fights are a lot of fun. Swinging them around with the touchscreen instead of the D-pad felt surprisingly natural. And that final fight with him and Bowser in the sky feels so much more intense and immersive with Bowser's new and more animated model. I mean, just look at the upgrade from this to this. It makes Bowser much more threatening. And collecting that final star after defeating him has never felt better. Super Mario Galaxy! Ideas and concepts for what would eventually become Super Mario Galaxy can be traced as far back as the year 2000, when Nintendo showcased the infamous Super Mario 128 tech demo at Space World 2000. The demo was initially meant to show off the power of the GameCube with 128 Marios running around all at once, but after pondering the potential of the spherical based platform shown off in the demo, director of the project Yoshiaki Koizumi desperately wanted to see the idea fully realized and featured in a future Nintendo game. However, for quite a while he was held back by others' beliefs that implementing this feature would be impossible due to technical reasons. Despite this though, Koizumi never gave up on the idea and eventually created prototypes of Mario walking around on different spherical objects. And after seeing these prototypes, Shigeru Miyamoto gave Koizumi the green light to start working on a 3D Mario game that would fully incorporate and realize these ideas. Initially, Super Mario Galaxy didn't feature any motion controls at all, with the iconic spin attack being performed by quickly rotating the nunchuck's control stick. However, once it was confirmed to the team that the Wii Remote would have full motion sensing abilities, the spin would now be performed by shaking the remote. Along with that, a pointer was now added to shoot and collect star bits. And after a less than 3 year development period spanning from late 2004 to mid 2007, Super Mario Galaxy was released here in North America on November 12th, 2007. <coughs> Upon starting the game for the first time, you're met with one of the best video game openings of all time. It starts off with a cute storybook style explanation of what the Star Festival is, before taking a page out of Super Mario 64's opening and showing you a letter Peach wrote to Mario inviting him to the castle for the Star Festival. After that, we see Mario joyfully making his way to Peach's castle, before we finally get to take control of him and explore around. The Star Festival is such a perfect way to open the game. The music, the starlit skies, and the cheerful toads create an atmosphere that is so welcoming and delightful. I used to create brand new save files over and over again when I was a kid, just so I could play through this opening again. 
I really haven't been able to see any other Nintendo game be able to compare to the pure joy present in this one small area. But this isn't even close to the best part of the game's intro. After making your way closer to the castle, that beautiful atmosphere is quickly interrupted by the sound of explosions and screaming as airships sporting Bowser's flag make their way into the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario is seen running for his life as buildings collapse and toads are crystallized right in front of his eyes. Bowser has completely ruined the festival and seems to actually be showing that he's a real threat this time around, something I've always loved about this game. Just look at the cutscene of his confrontation with Peach. You can hear the arrogance in his voice even though you can't understand a word he's saying. Could you imagine this scene with his sunshine voice? It wouldn't be nearly as effective at portraying his threat level. My favorite scene in the opening definitely has to be the last one though. Peach's castle has been carried up to space with Mario on board, and the Magikoopa Kamek shows up out of nowhere charging a spell in his wand before finally releasing it onto Mario, sending him flying off into space as Kamek, Peach, and the entire castle seemingly disappear into space. The level of cinematography present in this one scene is insane for a Mario game, and it's all amplified by the legendary work of Koji Kondo with the score playing in the background. This opening perfectly sets the tone for the game, and I will never not enjoy watching it. But somehow after such an intense and in-your-face opening, the game is seamlessly able to wind things down with its tutorial. You awaken on a small planet and are tasked with finding three star bunnies that have hidden around the place. By looking for these bunnies, you're also familiarizing yourself with the controls more. However, this time in a much more relaxed environment. Along with familiarizing us with the controls, this small planet is also teaching us how it feels to platform around on a spherical object. The seamlessness of the tutorials in this game are perfect. I hate it when a game stops me and tells me exactly what to do. A good game is able to communicate that without interrupting the flow of the gameplay. In addition to Super Mario Galaxy's brilliance when it comes to flow of gameplay, the game also excels in its pacing. I mean, you would think the sudden transition from relaxing tutorial planet with not a single threat to the enemy filled planet with tons of areas to fall and die would be incredibly jarring, but the sound design and opening cutscene make that transition feel great. The opening cutscene set up the fact that Mario lost. He was sent flying off into space by Kamek. But now after a quick rest and having obtained his new star spin powers, he's ready to go find Bowser and he's determined to defeat him. The music perfectly reflects this as well. You can feel the determination present inside this track. The soundtrack of this game is masterfully done. And while on the topic of this game's legendary soundtrack, there's one specific thing that it does that I absolutely adore. And that's the progression of the Comet Observatory theme. When you first visit the observatory, the music is calm. Not many instruments are being used, and the ones that are create a quiet atmosphere. But it makes sense. The observatory is pretty empty at the moment. It has little to no power with almost all of its areas shrouded in shadow. However, once you collect more grand stars and other parts of the observatory are given life again, the music reflects this, getting more instruments added to it, making the place feel more lively as more and more lumas become present on the ship. All of this culminates to the last rendition of the theme. The theme that plays once you collect all the grand stars and the common observatory is whole again. This track is absolutely beautiful. It feels so complete and full of life. Walking around the observatory while this track plays is such a treat. And since we're here in the observatory, why don't we add Talk about the observatory! This place is right behind Mario 64's Peach's Castle in terms of being my favorite video game hub world. I always loved how the six domes around the observatory represent different areas you would find in a home slash spaceship, further cementing the fact that the common observatory is a home for Rosalina and the Lumas. You got the terrace, the fountain, the kitchen, the bedroom, the engine room, and the garden. Each of their respective interiors also represents what their name is, as you would probably expect with places like the kitchen having an oven inside of it, and the bedroom having, well, a bed inside of it. But my absolute favorite dome has to be the garden. It's so different from all the other domes, and the calm atmosphere of it just makes me want to sit here and look at the background and listen to the ambience. It feels like such a secret area being hidden all the way at the top of the observatory. 
In other regions, more specifically Japan, where the game was made, the garden is referred to as the loft, which makes more sense with it being at pretty much the highest point of the ship. Overall, the common observatory is amazing. There's so many different areas to explore, little secrets to find, and characters to talk to that really make the place feel alive. But I mean, it wouldn't be a Super Mario Galaxy video if I didn't talk about the different galaxies you explore in the game. While I won't be able to talk about every single one, as that would take a while, I'm just going to mention the ones I have a lot to say about. Starting off with... Beach Bowl Galaxy. It takes place on a tropical beach planet. You got this fun vine I used to swing off for hours, and an actually good underwater section. It's not insanely impressive in terms of design or anything, but I've always enjoyed beach levels in Mario games. The music is always so cheerful, and the objective is usually pretty laid back, which allows for you to have fun exploring the place. This level also features one of the first appearances of the Ice Flower. Originally introduced a few years back in Mario and Luigi Partners in Time, the Ice Flower makes its first mainline debut in Super Mario Galaxy, and what a great debut it is. Using the Ice Flower to wall jump a waterfall, or skate effortlessly across bodies of water feels amazing. I love how the power-up turns Mario into a living ice sculpture instead of just being a fire flower palette swap because it makes the power-up feel more distinct and unique. And sure, Beach Bowl Galaxy introduces the ice flower, but it's not the greatest use of it. For that, we'll have to take a look at my personal favorite galaxy in this game, Freeze Flame Galaxy. The aesthetic of this level is incredible, specifically in the ice section. The blue tones of the planet combined with the music and skybox create such a distinct icy feeling. It's very unique. The use of the ice flower here, as stated before, is amazing. Trying to platform across the water geysers before the power-up timer runs out was always so fun to me for some reason, and the fight with Baron Burr can genuinely be challenging. But after exploring the ice section and defeating Baron Burr, you get to explore the fiery section of the galaxy. Here you were introduced to the fire flower. It functions just like it would in any other Mario game, however this time on a strict time limit, making it much more valuable. You use it throughout the level to light torches and eventually collect the star. Now, those two stars were fun. You got to explore the ice section and you got to explore the fiery section. But the third star is where this level really starts to shine. You make use of both power-ups. First, you have to traverse through both fiery and icy climates and use the fire flower to light two torches that create a launch star which guides you to the ice flower section. Using the ice flower, you skate carefully across a bunch of squares of lava before finally reaching the star. I know it's not much, but I always enjoyed how the first two stars introduce you to both fire and ice, and the last one combines the two to ultimately make the galaxy live up to its name as Freeze Flame Galaxy. Moving on to another great stage, we have Battle Rock Galaxy. This galaxy sees Mario exploring what seems to be the remnants of an old militaristic battle planet that Bowser has taken over. The outside of the place is filled with cannons and lasers that Mario has to avoid. The music is epic and suspenseful. It's the perfect music for a galactic war, but at the same time has this slowness to it, almost symbolic of this place's long past. All the stars that take place in this galaxy are very extravagant and epic. The first sees you dodging cannons and lasers. The second sees you using bob to blow up everything in your path to eventually reach the inside of the place and blow up a part of it from the inside. The last star has you again going inside the battle rock, this time causing an even bigger explosion on the inside, completely destroying the place. Just look at this scene, it's so cool to see in a Mario game. Battle Rock Galaxy also showcases one of the coolest things the galaxies in this game often do, and that's tell a story. Each of the stars here are connected in some way. The first sees you scout out the place, the second sees you heading into one of its sections and blowing it up from the inside, and the last sees you finally completely destroying the place, freeing it from Bowser's control. On the complete opposite side of the spectrum from Battle Rock though, we have Space Junk Galaxy. This galaxy isn't epic or suspenseful, nor is it full of explosions and cinematic shots. Rather, it's empty and full of trash. Most of your time here is just spent floating around in space, listening to the calm music and appreciating the beautiful space sky. Battle Rock and Space Junk both represent how a lot of people interpret space in their mind. 
Some see it as this place full of epic galactic wars filled with explosions and suspenseful music, while others see it as an empty, trash-filled field full of nothing but stars and the occasional planet. Super Mario Galaxy does a marvelous job at depicting space in so many ways as possible, but also leaving so much of it up for interpretation. There truly are an infinite amount of ways you can interpret this game's levels. Please, comment how you interpret some of your favorite galaxies in this game. I would love to hear how other people feel. The last galaxy I wanted to talk about in this section is Honeyhive Galaxy. This galaxy always stood out to me. It's a lot more open than a lot of the galaxies you explore in the game. I remember getting lost in this place as a kid. Its cheerful music and lively residence just made me want to stick around and explore every inch of the planet. This galaxy also features the introduction of a fan favorite Mario power-up. The Bee Mushroom. The Bee Mushroom turns Mario into a bee and gives him the ability to fly around, stick to honeycombs, stand on flowers, and uh, do whatever the hell this is. This power-up is very creative, and one I would love to see return at some point in a future Mario game. Exploring Honeyhive with the Bee power-up is just fun. It's such a goofy power-up that is also surprisingly useful. But I mean, how could I possibly mention Honeyhive Galaxy without talking about the iconic character it introduced to the Mario series? Captain Toad! I mean, who doesn't love this little guy? Story. It's not something you ever expect from a Mario game. The games have always had a much bigger focus on gameplay rather than to tell a story. But Super Mario Galaxy is different. Director of the game, Yoshiaki Koizumi, has always had a love for storytelling in video games. However, Shigeru Miyamoto, producer of the game and director of almost every mainline Mario and Zelda game, has famously hated stories in Mario games. It's very possible that the story of Super Mario Galaxy would have gone much deeper than it did, if not for Miyamoto keeping a constant watch over the game to make sure it didn't happen. But despite Miyamoto's watchful eye, Koizumi was able to sneak in one of Mario's greatest stories ever. Rosalina's Storybook. Available to the player after they collect the third Grand Star, Rosalina's Storybook was written by Koizumi late one night after everyone had left the office, so no one would know what was in it so that it would be a surprise to everyone when they played the game. The story is about Rosalina's past, and how she ended up on the Comet Observatory, although she presents it as more of a fairy tale, never referring to the girl in the book as herself. Reading through this as a kid, and even now, was one of my favorite parts of the entire game. The artwork is so beautiful and the writing is fantastic. It's surprising that Koizumi wrote the entire thing in just one night. Through the storybook, you will learn a lot more about Rosalina, and in turn probably will end up liking the character more. Giving a character a backstory like this is important. It allows the player to be more immersed in the game, which is key to leaving an impact and creating memories that the player will cherish forever. The morning after he wrote it, Koizumi even showed the book to Miyamoto, who surprisingly loved it. Stories weren't the only thing that Super Mario Galaxy did well though. This game features some of, if not the best, Bowser fights in any Mario game. And along with that features incredible levels before the fights. The first Bowser level, Bowser Star Reactor, kicks things off by bringing back the Road to Bowser theme from Super Mario 64. This time fully orchestrated. Hearing this music is great and all, but it just fits so well with the stage. The entire level is reminiscent of Super Mario 64's Road to Bowser levels, however putting a Super Mario Galaxy spin on it, incorporating lots of gravity-based platforming that just feels incredible. The fight itself though is a whole nother spectacle to behold. You have to lure Bowser into breaking the glass of his reactor and touching the lava. This causes him to start running around in pain and gives Mario a chance to flip him over and attack him using the star spin. What I love about this fight is that the music is dynamic, with a choir kicking in once Bowser is vulnerable further immersing the player in this epic fight. It also feels so incredible to just physically shake the remote and see Bowser go flying. Even when playing this game on Switch using the Pro Controller, I still shake the controller to spin when I fight Bowser, just because of how satisfying it feels. The second Bowser stage features a just as great road to Bowser than the one before it, seeing the player again platforming through a level very reminiscent of Mario 64's Bowser levels. The fight itself is very similar to the first, however Bowser has learned some new moves this time and attacks you more frequently. The third and final Bowser level though, is where things get a bit more interesting. 
After watching this incredible cutscene of Rosalina guiding the Comet Observatory to the center of the universe, you're met with a level unlike any Bowser level we've ever seen before. This level isn't reminiscent at all of Mario 64's Road to Bowser stages. This one is completely unique, and the music reflects this, offering us an entirely new track. The level sees you using all your skills you've learned up to this point to brave through it all and find Bowser. You start by using your knowledge of gravity to make your way up and around this tower to a launch star. Next, you make your way around a lava planet, using your lava platforming skills learned back in Freeze Flame and Melty Monster Galaxy. Moving on, you make your way to the ice planet, skating across ice blocks that appear out of thin air, all while avoiding that fatally cold ice that sits below you. After that, you make your way across the sand planet, wall jump your way up this gravity section, and finally make your way into the eye of the storm. The field of view increase you get once you land here makes this area feel so cool. I've always loved how creative and unique this final level is. It's such a perfect test of the player's skills. And after making your way through that gauntlet, you're met with the one and only Bowser. This final fight is so good. The first planet has Bowser come completely out of left field with this new move he's never used before, causing you to try to figure out a solution on the fly. The second planet is the same way. You have to on the fly figure out a way to attack Bowser. Oh my god, it's so good! And just like all the other fights, spinning Bowser around here feels amazing. The last planet takes you to the center of the universe. The stakes are high, the music is loud, and Bowser is angry. On this planet, Bowser returns to an attack you're familiar with, and with the use of a good spin attack, you defeat him, and watch as he plummets into lava. Such a cool sequence. This whole fight is just perfect. Bowser coming up with new attacks and forcing the player to find a new way to attack him, the music ramping up at just the right time, and the showdown at the center of the universe was so cool to me when I played this game as a kid. It was the most immersed I'd been in a game in my whole life. But as you probably know, that's not the end of it. After collecting the Grand Star, saving Peach, and walking back to the Common Observatory, Bowser's galaxy reactor explodes, creating a huge black hole, sucking everyone inside, and while just watch for yourself. Even now, 10 years after I originally beat the game, this final cutscene still impresses me. The shot of the Lumas all diving into the black hole, and the literal Big Bang happening is so cool, and just goes to show how amazing this game is. It goes above and beyond in almost every way. There's absolutely no way it could get any bet. Hey wait, what's that? Super Luigi Galaxy! Yes, Luigi. After collecting all 120 stars as Mario and defeating Bowser, you unlock one of the best New Game Pluses to ever exist. Super Luigi Galaxy. A mode that allows you to play through the entirety of the game as Luigi. Luigi also controls a little differently than Mario, running faster, jumping higher, and slipping a little more than Mario ever did. Overall, Super Luigi Galaxy is an amazing New Game Plus. And hey, after collecting all 120 stars with both Luigi and Mario, you get to play through one final level, a level I've always loved. But I won't spoil that. I really think it's worth it to play through and experience it for yourself. Super Mario Galaxy is one of the greatest video games ever made. Even after playing it time and time again, I will never not enjoy it. It has one of the deepest stories that a Mario game has ever told, and one of the best soundtracks Nintendo has ever produced. 
Its galaxies feature some of the most unique level design in the series, which each of them having their own distinct vibe and atmosphere. The game features some of the best Bowser fights in the series and is able to create memories that will stick with you for the rest of your life. Super Mario Galaxy is one of the highest rated games of all time for a reason. There are so many unique, fun, and creative ideas present here that they still weren't done. This game opened up the possibility for so many new ideas that they made an entire sequel for the game in just three years. Super Mario Galaxy is an absolute masterpiece. Welcome! Welcome New Galaxy! After Super Mario Galaxy 1 released to critical acclaim back in 2007, Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto approached the team who developed the game and requested that a follow-up to it be made. This follow-up was originally meant to be nothing more than some new levels and bosses, very similar to what you see in DLC for games nowadays. At first, the team wasn't immediately on board with Miyamoto's idea of a follow-up, but after meeting together and reflecting on their work on Galaxy, the team realized just how many things they wished they could have implemented in Galaxy 1, and just how many things they wished they could have done better in the game. After this meeting, the team was booming with ideas for this follow-up. Everyone working on the game, even the visual and sound designers, had their own idea for a unique stage or gimmick. And due to all these ideas, the game eventually expanded from a simple follow-up under the title of Super Mario Galaxy More, to a full-fledged sequel under the title of Super Mario Galaxy 2. The big thing that inspired the team's sudden boom in ideas and spirit during Galaxy 2's early development was the inclusion of Yoshi. Yoshi was a character that the team desperately wanted to include in the first game. But whether it be due to time constraints or just Nintendo's higher-ups not wanting to bloat the game with too many features that they wouldn't be able to fully expand upon, he was never added. With Galaxy 2, however, Yoshi was going to be one of the game's main selling points and was absolutely going to be fully expanded upon. Yoshi's inclusion in the game opened up the possibility to so many new gameplay and level ideas, and was instrumental in keeping the team's morale alive during their early stages of development. And after a just over two year development period spanning from late 2007 to early 2010, Super Mario Galaxy 2 was officially released here in North America on May 23rd, 2010. Upon starting the game, you're met with a very similar opening to that of the first game. Peach has invited Mario over to the castle to eat cake and watch the Star Festival, a festival that only occurs once every 100 years. The big difference with Galaxy 2's opening, however, is just how much more simple it is. In Galaxy 1, you had this beautiful storybook-style explanation of what the Star Festival was, a fully voice-acted letter from Peach, a 3D environment to explore that was just gorgeous by Wii standards, and of course, the amazing cutscenes. Here though, all those amazing things that made the original's opening so great are extremely dumbed down here and kind of make the entire thing feel uninspired in ways. I mean, the whole sequence is almost entirely in 2D, plot points that were well executed in Galaxy 1 like Mario's introduction to his companion Luma and Bowser kidnapping Peach now feel forced, the atmosphere is much less immersive, and generally everything is just a lot more bare bones. Now, despite all these issues, I do think this opening can partially be excused. I mean, you have to take into account the fact that everyone playing Galaxy 2 has most likely already played Galaxy 1, and since story-wise Galaxy 2 is framed as a retelling of Galaxy 1, as evident from the very first screen in the game saying, now let me tell you a new story that also begins with Stardust, and the Star Festival happening again despite a hundred years clearly not having passed, this opening was most likely much more simple and to the point because pretty much everyone already knows how this story starts. And instead of wasting development time trying to recapture the beauty of an opening everyone already experienced, they just decided to throw the player right into the action so they could experience the new stuff. Overall, I think this opening is fine. It's obviously a huge downgrade from Galaxy 1's, but with the added context of this game being a retelling, it at least makes a little more sense that way. Moving into the first level of this game, Sky Station Galaxy, I actually really like this stage. 
It does such a great job at subtly introducing how this game's physics work, in a way that allows players who never played Galaxy 1 to, over the course of the level, get a decent understanding of how the gravity and movement works, but also in a way that doesn't bore people already familiar with how Galaxy's physics work with long-winded tutorial areas. Galaxy 2 even goes as far to reward those familiar with the controls and physics by adding this faster path you can take by spinning and wall jumping on the side of Yoshi's house to reach the top quickly. This is an absolutely genius way to handle the first level of a sequel. Rather than heavily focusing on one audience and alienating the other, the game instead strikes a pretty good balance between the two and creates a level that very seamlessly appeals to both those familiar with Galaxy's controls and those who are newcomers to the series. There are so many little things in this level that you don't really think about, like this miniature planet section here, that are actually there to help newcomers understand how concepts like gravity work. It's incredibly clever. And speaking of clever design choices, let's talk about this game's hub world, Starship Mario. Starship Mario is honestly one of my favorite video game hub worlds. I mean, it's obviously no Peach's Castle, Comet Observatory, or Delfino Plaza, but it's still really cool in its own ways. For one, I mean you got Lubba. Lubba is essentially the Rosalina equivalent of this game, minus the incredibly emotional and well-crafted backstory, of course. As a kid, I always loved Lubba. He seems like this lively, jolly little Luma who just wanted to help Mario out. But looking back at him now, I don't know. I don't really trust him that much. But we'll talk about him a little more later. Returning back to Starship Mario itself, this place is so cool. Despite literally just being a giant Mario head, it's designed in a way that actually takes advantage of that. Things like the transition from Mario's hair to his hat are represented through a staircase, the area where Mario's neck would be is represented by a small fenced area, the brim of Mario's hat is a stone wall, Mario's ear hole is a pipe, it's all so charming. The gravity here is also taken advantage of really well. Running and jumping around feels amazing. I really love how they decided to make a giant planetoid a hub world. My absolute favorite thing about this hub world though, is how over time, and as you explore more galaxies, more and more characters populate the ship and make the place feel a lot more lively. With these new characters also comes a progression in Starship Mario's theme over time, almost identical to what they did with the Comet Observatory in Galaxy 1. At first, the theme only uses a few instruments, but as more characters start to call Starship Mario their home, the music reflects this, getting a lot more lively, before finally feeling complete. Details like this are what make the Galaxy games so special to me. This is something you wouldn't notice at all really in gameplay, but when you do, it makes you appreciate the games a lot more. Overall, Starship Mario, while definitely not as cool and memorable as the Comet Observatory, is still an excellent hub world. Walking around this place is a ton of fun, and I will always enjoy talking with the various NPCs scattered about. But hey, while we're in Starship Mario, how about we check out something new in Galaxy 2? The world map. I honestly don't really like this. The world map makes the progression feel a lot more linear, and the map itself is pretty soulless. Just compare the world map here to the domes in Galaxy 1. The domes not only made the progression feel natural and made unlocking things tons of fun, they were also very aesthetically pleasing. Places like the fountain, the bedroom, and the garden made the common observatory feel like a home. And choosing a level from the solar system-esque map just made the entire experience a lot more immersive. Whereas navigating Galaxy 2's world map just feels like navigating a new Super Mario Bros. world map, except minus the cool background environments. But Galaxy 2's world map isn't all bad. For one, I really like the custom music each world has. It's a genuine step up from Galaxy 1's domes that just use the same music throughout all of them. Another thing I really like about Galaxy 2's world map is how, depending on what world you're in, the sky surrounding Starship Mario will change to reflect that. Just take a look. This is such a cool detail, and creates at least a little bit of atmosphere. But moving away from the world map and Starship Mario, we have without a doubt one of the most important aspects to look at when judging if this game is a good sequel or not. 
the gameplay in Galaxies. And while I won't be able to mention every single galaxy in the game, I am going to mention a few that I think are worth talking about. Starting off with... Hytale Falls Galaxy. This galaxy makes use of Yoshi, and while not his first appearance in the game, that would be in Yoshi Star Galaxy, this has to be one of my favorite uses of him in the entire game. Hytale Falls' whole gimmick has the player make use of the Dash Pepper, a power-up exclusive to Yoshi that causes him to run at insane speeds that even a certain hedgehog would be jealous of, only being able to be stopped by crashing into a wall. Throughout the entirety of this level, your goal is to try to control Yoshi at his insane speeds while dodging obstacles and taking sharp turns. I absolutely love how one of Galaxy 2's new additions, the Comet Medal, a coin that allows prankster comets to appear in whatever level you collect it in, has the player take a genuine risk in order to collect it here. What this galaxy does best though, is its creativity. The Dash Pepper is such a cool idea for Yoshi, because it makes controlling him essentially like driving an out of control car that's impossible to stop. And combining this with literally being able to run up and around walls, this whole level just gives you a huge adrenaline rush the first time around. It's a ton of fun. Speaking of a huge adrenaline rush in a stage, just look at Fleet Glide Galaxy. Fleet Glide Galaxy is less of an entire level and more of a short minigame, but I still think it's absolutely worth talking about. This galaxy has Mario teaming up and flying with a bird called Fluzzard. You control Fluzzard by tilting the Wii Remote in whatever direction you want to go very similar to controlling the plane in Wii Sports Resort's Island Flyover, with your goal being to reach the end of the stage without crashing. Apart from just how fun it is to fly with Fluzzard, the highlight of this stage is undoubtedly the atmosphere. The stage takes place on a giant rocket ship. This rocket ship is filled with tons of enemies to avoid, and at the very end of the stage, has the player literally avoiding falling pillars and support beams as the rocket ship collapses from the inside right in front of you with the thrilling orchestral music bringing it all together. This short minigame galaxy strikes a perfect balance between fun gameplay and breathtaking atmosphere. I love it. Winding things down a bit though, we have Starshine Beach Galaxy. This galaxy takes direct inspiration from Super Mario Sunshine with its more open level design, beach themed aesthetic, and literally just having Piantas inhabit the place. I think this stage honestly does the beach theme a lot better than Beach Bowl Galaxy does in the original Mario Galaxy. This level is just so much more open. I always find myself taking my time here, exploring the place, talking to the Piantas, and vibing to the music. This stage also makes great use of one of this game's new power-ups, the Cloud Flower, in one of its missions. In this mission, you use the Cloud Flower to scale this giant tower, but since touching the water with the Cloud Flower results in you losing the power-up, in order to have enough cloud platforms to reach the top, you have to glide across the water on a lily pad, very reminiscent of the lily pad ride from Sunshine. This level is just full of Sunshine references, even bringing back the famous Chucksters. This stage excels in a lot of ways, but I think the strongest is that it directly improves upon a level theme from the first game. But I mean, why stop at a galaxy inspired by another 3D Mario game? How about an entire remake of a Super Mario 64 level? Throwback Galaxy. This stage is amazing. It was an absolutely genius idea to bring this stage back for a Galaxy game. I mean, the original Womp's Fortress from Mario 64 was already floating in the air, and was one of the only stages in the game that you could literally fall off of into the void, and the linear design of the place makes it fit in surprisingly well with all the other galaxies. There are also some little details here that imply that Mario's already been here before, and actually establishes a bit of continuity between the games. You got the red bob who recognizes Mario, and the chipped wall Mario broke in the mission Blast Away the Wall back in Mario 64. Gameplay-wise, this stage is just a joy to play through. Platforming across the fortress and having that long-awaited rematch with the Womp King will just leave you with a giant smile on your face the entire time. Throwback Galaxy works as a remake here because Galaxy 2 doesn't over-rely on nostalgia throughout its entire runtime. Rather, it throws this in here as a cool little callback, but also because the stage's design genuinely works here. Its inclusion doesn't feel forced at all. Overall, the various different galaxies here are easily the strongest part of the entire game. I genuinely believe that the level design here is a big step up from Galaxy 1. There's so much creativity present in every stage, 
And the introduction of Yoshi, new power-ups, comet medals, and countless new stage gimmicks make the galaxies in this game absolutely a step up from the original game in terms of their gameplay. But gameplay isn't the only important aspect to consider when determining if a game is a good sequel or not, which leads me to my biggest gripe with Galaxy 2, its atmosphere and story. Starting off with the story, I obviously know Mario games aren't really about their story, but as the sequel to THE Mario game with a story, it's a real shame they didn't try to do anything here. I think they absolutely could have taken advantage of the fact that this game is a retelling and spiced things up a little bit. I mean just look at Lubba. Despite being a main character, he is barely explored at all. Just imagine how cool it would have been if we got a backstory for Lubba near the end of the game and it was revealed to the player that Lubba was an evil Luma cast off the common observatory. And the reason he was so reluctant and happy to help Mario was because he was using him to collect stars so he could take revenge on Rosalina and the other Lumas. I mean, he really only agrees to team up with Mario once he realizes he's trusted by young master Luma, an extremely powerful Luma. Lubba could have been an extremely cool twist villain near the end of the game before you fight Bowser. And his backstory could have really helped this game establish a bit more of a serious tone like Galaxy 1 had. I'm curious to hear what other people think of this though, so please, leave a comment on what you think of Galaxy 2's story. Moving on to the atmosphere, I think this was absolutely the biggest downgrade from Galaxy 1 to 2. The reason people love Galaxy 1 so much is largely because of its atmosphere. The atmosphere was the reason narrative elements like Rosalina's storybook and the final cutscene were so emotional. It was the reason the Star Festival and Bowser's airship attack were so immersive. And it was the reason galaxies like Gusty Garden and Buyo Base were so memorable. Super Mario Galaxy took space as a way to make levels more atmospheric. Whereas I feel Galaxy 2 kind of abandoned that, and instead took space as a way to make levels as outlandish and crazy as possible. I definitely think these approaches both have their strengths, but Galaxy 1 takes the cake here for me because it still did have those outlandish aspects we're used to with Mario. It just heavily leaned towards a more atmospheric approach, and in a lot of ways, made a first playthrough of that game more memorable than a first playthrough of Galaxy 2. There's just something about the atmosphere of the first game that has always stuck with me, and I really wish Galaxy 2 was able to expand upon that more, rather than straying away from it. But regardless of your thoughts on Galaxy 2's story and atmosphere, one thing I think we can all agree Galaxy 2 did really well was its Bowser levels. If we're talking atmosphere, I think these levels are one of the very few areas in this game that are actually able to capture Galaxy 1's atmosphere pretty well. The music here, along with the set pieces in these levels, are incredible. Gameplay wise, these stages are tons of fun too. I absolutely love the way the 2D sections and Bowser's gravity gauntlet take advantage of the gravity. And the giant floating cylinders in the snake block section and Bowser's lava layer are great too. The Bowser fights though are where things get a bit more interesting. Bowser's main gimmick in this game is that he is gigantic. Just absolutely huge. So the way you fight him here is much different than how you fought him in Galaxy 1, which I really appreciate. Instead of trying to flip Bowser over like you did in Galaxy 1, your goal here now is to wait for him to call a bunch of meteors in, avoid his punch that causes the meteors to rise from the ground, and ground pound the newly risen meteors at the right angle so they smack Bowser right in the face. I honestly really like this style of boss fight. It feels so satisfying to just smack Bowser in the face with a giant meteor. And while the first Bowser levels and fights are fun, they are nothing in comparison to the final level and fight. After battling your way through six worlds and collecting enough stars to advance forward, you're met with the final Bowser level of the game, Bowser's Galaxy Generator. This final level is pretty much a perfect combination of all the skills the game has taught you thus far along your journey. Very similar to Galaxy 1's final level, but also very different. This level makes use of power-ups you found along your journey like the Spindrel and Cloudflower, concepts you learned like how to platform in 2D around these cylindrical planets and even has you using Yoshi for a majority of it, making use of his Dash Pepper and Blimp Fruit abilities at one point. I really like this final stage, and while I don't know which one I like more, I absolutely think this stage lives up to Galaxy 1's final level. It has everything a final level needs in a Mario Galaxy game. It's suspenseful, action-packed, and fun. 
But after making your way through the final section of the stage and saying goodbye to Yoshi, you're met with the big man himself, Bowser. I really like this final fight. Bowser still does all the same stuff he did in the previous fight, but now his falling meteors try to predict where you'll be when they land, rather than just hovering above you. His flames are much harder to avoid, his punches and meteors send shockwaves across the planet, and overall, Bowser is just much more threatening. But after four hits to the face, Bowser is defeated, the Grand Star is free from his clutches, and before being able to say anything to Mario, Bowser plummets into the abyss, being sucked into some purple vortex. And with that, Mario can finally collect the final Grand Star. Bringing an end... Yeah, it's not that simple. After seemingly being defeated, Bowser returns and harnesses the power of the Grand Star yet again in a last ditch effort to defeat Mario. This final, final fight is so cool. Instead of avoiding Bowser's punches and meteors on a tiny planet, you're now literally in the midst of being sucked into a black hole and have to hit Bowser with the meteorites before he's able to catch up to you and attack you. The music and atmosphere here is perfect. It sucks that this is one of only a few cases where the game is like this, but hey, I'll take what I can get. This final sequence is executed masterfully and perfectly captures what the Galaxy games are all about. But even after the credits rolled, the game still isn't over yet. After returning to Starship Mario, you'll find that not only have you unlocked the ability to switch to Luigi at any time, but you've also unlocked an entire new world, World S. World S is full of so many creative galaxies that are an absolute joy to play through. You got Twisty Trials Galaxy, Rolling Coaster Galaxy, Boss Blitz Galaxy, and others too. World S is a really cool post-game edition, but the game doesn't just stop here. After collecting all 120 stars and defeating Bowser once again, you unlock the real post-game content of Galaxy 2, the Green Stars. Once you unlock them, Green Stars get spread about every single galaxy in the game. And when I say every galaxy, I mean every galaxy. The one-off Hungry Luma galaxies, the Bowser galaxies, and even the Fluzzard galaxies have their own fair share of green stars to collect. I think the green stars are an absolutely genius way to handle the post-game, and honestly are much better than the New Game Plus you get with Luigi in Mario Galaxy 1. Green stars incentivize you to look at levels in an entirely different way. So many areas in the game, like the top of this giant ramp in Hytale Falls, that at first seemingly had no reason to exist, now hold a green star to collect. I've had a ton of fun searching through levels, trying to find green stars, and just being surprised at how well some of them are hidden. And even if you may find collecting them all a little annoying, the reward for finding all 120 of them is absolutely worth it. You unlock the true final level of the game, Grand Master Galaxy. The first star of this level seems innocent enough. It's a decently challenging level, but has a bunch of checkpoints spread all throughout it and make beating it pretty manageable. The Prankster Comet Star of this stage, though, is one of the most infamous missions in Mario history. A mission that many regard as the hardest Mario level of all time. The Perfect Run. The Perfect Run not only makes sections of the first mission harder, it also removes every single checkpoint, and most notably, 
requires you to beat the entirety of the stage without getting hit once. I am not joking when I tell you it took me like 5 hours to beat this stage for the first time. It is easily one of the most equally fun and frustrating Mario levels of all time. And in my opinion, is the hardest Mario stage ever. Even harder than Champion's Road. Beating this level is one of the most satisfying feelings in any Mario game. Handheld Mario games have almost always been 2D. From Super Mario Land on the Game Boy to New Super Mario Bros. on the DS, people never really expected a full 3D Mario game to be released on a handheld. The only time it ever happened was with Super Mario 64 DS, and that was a remake. But in 2011, all of that would change with the release of Nintendo's most powerful handheld yet, the 3DS. This system was able to achieve graphics on par with the GameCube, and in 2011, this was a pretty big deal for Nintendo. And although the system may not have launched with it, the 3DS would see the release of the first fully original handheld 3D Mario game. The very appropriately titled, Super Mario 3D Land. Developed by the same team responsible for both Super Mario Galaxy games, Super Mario 3D Land was designed to bridge the gap between 2D and 3D Mario games. Ever since Super Mario 64, the difference between 2D and 3D Mario has been night and day. 3D Mario games are about adventure, open level design, and pure creativity. While 2D Mario games, on the other hand, are more traditional. The formula has stayed pretty much the same since its inception back in 1985, with the release of Super Mario Bros. on the NES. But with this game, Nintendo wanted to change that. By combining elements from both 2D and 3D Mario, they were essentially able to create what producer Shigeru Miyamoto describes as a 3D Mario that plays like a 2D Mario game. Along with bridging the gap between 2D and 3D Mario, Super Mario 3D Land was also created to take advantage of the 3DS's new 3D effect. By flicking the slider on the side of the system, you're more easily able to tell the distance and location of different things on the screen. Throughout development, the team wanted to take full advantage of this and designed a lot of the levels in the game around this 3D effect. I guess it sucks that Nintendo gave up on the 3D gimmick halfway through the system's lifetime. Failed console gimmicks aside though, after a two year development period from mid-2009 to mid-2011, Super Mario 3D Land was released here in North America on November 13th, 2011. Super Mario 3D Land opens up with a violent storm. We see Peach's castle in the background, but the main focus here is on this tree, which seems to have tanuki leaves flying off it. The next morning, Mario and some toads come across the tree and find a letter floating around nearby. Upon opening it up, they find out that the unthinkable has happened. Bowser kidnapped Peach. Mario is clearly shaken as this has never happened before, and runs off to go find Bowser. This opening is fine, but it really feels more like a 2D Mario opening rather than a 3D one, which is probably what they were going for anyway. After the opening, we're introduced to the world map which is uh, j just a straight line. I don't think this ruins the game in any way at all, it's just kind of weird. Like, even the new Super Mario Bros. games had more interesting world maps than this. And often they even had split paths that would lead to different levels. Considering this game's short development period though, they probably were strictly focused on gameplay and level design, and other elements like the opening and world map were just thrown together last second and made as simple as possible. Jumping into the first level though, it's great. The stage introduces the big returning power-up of this game, the Tanuki Leaf. Functioning pretty much the exact same way as it did in Mario 3, but now in 3D. The power-up feels amazing. It feels so natural to control, and I absolutely love that instead of introducing a brand new power-up that would most likely get old really quick, they decided to return to one we hadn't seen used in decades, and show just how well it translates into 3D. The Tanuki Leaf isn't the only thing this first level reintroduces though. Almost immediately after collecting it, you'll notice a star coin. And similar to every Mario game before it that's featured star coins, each level has three of them spread all throughout to collect. Star coins are by far my favorite part of 3D Land. Even though I've 100%ed this game on multiple occasions, when I went back and played through it for this video, I just couldn't stop collecting them. And by the time I ended up beating the game, I'd collected every single star coin you could get in the main story. 
The reason this game works so well in 3D is because of the star coins. Without them, you would have no reason to explore the level, and your goal would just be to rush to the end of the stage. The game understands the importance of star coins as well, as in some cases they are literally required to move on. You will get so much more out of this game's levels by exploring them and finding their secrets. Exploration has always been a staple of 3D Mario games, and 3D Land incorporates that aspect incredibly well with its star coins. And on the topic of the levels in 3D Land, they're just as amazing as the star coins. I was genuinely amazed at how creative and enjoyable all the stages were, even after playing through this game so many times. 3D Land without a doubt features some of the absolute best Mario stages of all time, and I want to specifically highlight some of the ones from the main game I enjoyed the most. Starting off with... 2-3. This stage revolves around platforming across and exploring giant 8-bit sprites from the original Super Mario Bros. game. You start off on an 8-bit Mario and eventually make your way across many other iconic sprites like the Super Mushrooms and Princess Peaches. You can also find a hidden 8-bit Luigi if you spin this tailwheel at the beginning. I love how it takes Mario's shoe pixels and puts them on Luigi, so the transition feels seamless in a sense. The end of the stage even features a recreation of Super Mario Bros. 1-1 ending, complete with the original level end theme and everything. But moving on from the nostalgic 2-3, we have the open-ended 3-1. This level is unique because of, well, its openness. You're set loose in this small desert area with a giant tower at its center, and have the option to either explore the outside of the place, or use the cannon to scale the tower. To me, this level gives big Mario Galaxy vibes. It feels like a planet you would travel to in some sort of desert-themed galaxy, and I love it for that. It's also very clear this stage was meant to be explored, as your timer has an extra 200 seconds added onto it encouraging that. The outside has a bunch of enemies to avoid, but also a bunch of secrets to find. You have this music note section, and even a hidden star coin behind some bricks. I absolutely love how different this stage is from all the rest in the game. It uses open-ended level design as its gimmick, which is just so cool. Even once you're inside the tower, that open-ended level design is still pretty prevalent, with the inside offering some different paths at times. Moving on though, we have easily one of the coolest levels in the game, 5-2. This stage is heavily inspired by the 2D Zelda series with its fixed top-down camera angle and more Zelda dungeon-esque layout. Even just the layout alone being inspired by 2D Zelda would have been enough to make this stage stand out. But the fact that they fully embrace the inspiration and design parts of the level similar to how Zelda dungeons work is incredible. I mean, just look at some of the star coins. The first one is hidden away in this small area you can barely see, which I can only imagine is referencing the bombable walls in Zelda 1 that were impossible to tell apart. The second involves using a fire flower to light torches, obviously referencing a common Zelda series trope, even playing the iconic puzzle solve jingle. This level seamlessly blends both the Zelda and Mario formulas together to create a level that I absolutely love. Last up for this section, we have my personal favorite stage in the game, 7-4. This one takes place inside a giant clock, very reminiscent of TikTok Clock from Super Mario 64, but in my opinion, done a lot better than that level. Almost every aspect of the stage is always moving, and you have to time your platforming to be in tune with that rhythm. I love how unique this entire stage is. It never overuses a single concept and constantly introduces new ones throughout its short runtime. It also has a completely unique song made for it that fits it so well. I used to constantly replay this one all the time when I was younger. I love how creative it is. The levels in this game are amazing. Each one features a unique concept and each one fleshes out that concept incredibly well. Similar to Luigi U, there isn't a level in this game that I disliked. It really feels like a lot of time was put into making them as creative and well thought out as they could be. The little details present in some of these stages make them so special. And although some of them may be short, I would so much rather that than a longer level that's just filled with pre-used concept and filler to pad out the length of the game. The reason the level design works so well in 3D Land is because of its creativity. Where most 2D Mario games have levels designed around the world they take place in, like how a snow world has snow levels or a jungle world has jungle levels, 3D Land's levels don't care about having or following a distinct theme for their world. They're just unique. One of the best examples of this is a stage in World 8. This stage is filled with green grass, happy music, and a vibrant forest below, while the world map for World 8 shows that it's filled with lava and volcanoes. So sure, world and level theming is good, yes, 
but 3D Land understands that its main focus is level design, and doesn't hold back well-designed levels just because it doesn't adhere to a certain theme. Moving on from the levels though, I want to talk about something that 3D Land handles really well. Perception. As you probably know, one of the defining features of the 3DS was its stereoscopic 3D. With the flick of a slider, you were able to see the world in a whole new way. And while this 3D effect certainly helped all throughout the game, offering more depth to the areas you were exploring, this effect is best used in the game's optical illusion areas, where it may seem like a block is in a certain position, but after turning the 3D effect on, you realize it's in a completely different location. And although I can't really show how the 3D effect works and you'll just have to take my word for it, the use of 3D in this game is heavily underappreciated and works extraordinarily well. At the end of every world in this game, there's either a castle or an airship. In most cases, it's an airship, but in World 1, 5, and 8, it's a castle. These airship and castles are some of the coolest parts of the game, not only in their level design, but also their boss fights. World 1 and 5's castle levels are a lot of fun. It's so cool to see a Bowser's castle level in 3D, and the fights with Bowser himself are a ton of fun. He's so gigantic and scale to Mario, and really feels threatening at times. The airship levels, though, are where this game really gets good. They're designed so well and a lot of fun to platform through. The first is very simple. You're not doing anything crazy, but rather getting well adjusted to how an airship level works in 3D. The second one, though, is amazing. It involves avoiding skewers, spikes, and bob bombs. It's so much more open than the previous and really takes advantage of the fact that the game is 3D. At the end of each of these airship levels, you fight a boss. At first it's Boom Boom, and he actually translates really well into 3D. And honestly, he's done better in this game than he is in New Super Mario Bros. U. I love how he goes into a shell and tries to attack you instead of just sitting there like he does in other Mario games. After you beat Boom Boom a few times though, you're introduced to a new boss enemy, Pom Pom. Instead of spinning around barbarically like Boom Boom, Pom Pom is more calculated, shooting shurikens and homing in on the player with her shell. I love the introduction of Pom Pom. I find it so lame when a boss is constantly reused throughout a game, so 3D Land introducing a completely new boss enemy halfway throughout its runtime really freshens things up. Pom Pom's fights are a lot more interesting than Boom Boom's, and I absolutely love seeing her return in this game's sequel, Super Mario 3D World. And while Boom Boom's and Pom Pom's fights on their own were great, World 7's airship takes things to the next level, and pits you against both of them at the same time. This fight is genuinely difficult at points, and the two work really well together in battle. It's hard to avoid both of their attacks at the same time due to how differently they act. But after defeating Boom Boom and Pom Pom for good, and making your way through the final world of the main game, World 8, you're met with what seems to be the final level of the game, 8-Bowser. To even get into this stage, you need 90 star coins, which is a lot. Jumping into the level itself though, it's incredible. You have the two Magikoopas on you right as you start the level. There's an arrow platform section where you have to use them to cross a lake all while the Magmargs rise up from below. The stage features a lot of different elements that are put together incredibly well and combined to make a level that the player will always remember. The real highlight of this stage though has to be the Bowser fight. It's very similar to the last two before it, but just a little more fleshed out and difficult enough to make it feel fresh. After defeating Bowser here though, you quickly learn that this wasn't the true final fight as he, uh, does whatever this is, and makes his escape with Peach in hand. I'm so glad this wasn't the final fight, because while yes it works well as a Bowser fight, it absolutely does not work well as a final Bowser fight. It's way too similar to the ones before it, and not extravagant or epic like most final Bowser fights are. On to the real final level though, I cannot stress enough how good it is. The entire stage takes place on a spine coaster, with the level opening with the spine coaster going right into a giant Bowser mouth. This stage is both a spectacle and a difficult challenge. The entire time I'm playing it, I want to look around at the scenery and appreciate Bowser's giant castle, but constantly the level has you narrowly avoiding fireballs that shoot out from the walls. The end of the stage even has you quickly swerving back and forth as the onslaught of fireballs gets even more crazy. The absolute best part of this stage though is its length. It's incredibly short, but the Spine Coaster ride is way more fun this way, as if it was any longer, it would definitely have started to drag on and get boring. This final level is one of the best examples of 3D Land understanding the importance of concise level design, 
If a stage works better short, then make it short. Runtime is not a defining factor in what makes a game good. Just look at Bowser's Fury. Moving on though, after making your way through the spine coaster and shooting your way up to Bowser's Tower, you're on the doorstep of one of the greatest final fights in Mario history. After falling down with Mario as well, Bowser does everything in his power to try to stop you. He shoots fireballs, throws spikes, and even throws barrels like he's Donkey Kong. You'll never be him, Bowser. This fight is more of a platforming challenge than a battle, and it works really well because of that. I love how after you flip the switch and make him fall into the lava, he just shows up 5 minutes later like nothing happened. This time shooting even more powerful fireballs as the entire stage crumbles with each new jump you make. All of this culminates to the final section, a chase sequence where Bowser dashes at Mario at full speed. All while you have to avoid bricks that you have less than a second to react to. This whole chase scene is incredibly tense, and by far one of the coolest final sequences in Mario history. Upon the defeat of Bowser, the sky clears and Mario is finally able to rescue Peach. And right after doing so, makes use of the Tanuki Leaf and flies off with her back to the Mushroom Kingdom, bringing a wonderful end to this incredible game. But surely this game couldn't get any better than this, right? Help me! Oh, but it can. After beating the game, you don't only unlock one special world, but eight. Eight special worlds, doubling the amount of courses in this game. These special worlds feature remix courses from that of the main game, and also sometimes entirely new courses. The remix courses are a lot of fun, and genuinely are different enough from the courses they originate from to feel fresh. You also unlock the ability to play as Luigi once you beat the first special world castle, which is absolutely amazing. The levels in these special worlds offer a great challenge and introduce so many ideas to pre-existing levels and overall create one of the absolute best post games of any Mario game. I strongly recommend you try out these special world levels if you never have. They are very much worth it. Underrated. That is the best word I can use to describe Super Mario 3D Land. This game features such a beautiful mess of unique and creative ideas that combine together to create some of the best level design the Mario series has to offer. Constantly throughout this game, you'll be surprised at just how many new ideas it manages to have. Even in just the first world alone, 3D Land consistently introduces, fleshes out, and moves on to a multitude of different ideas. When I first planned to go back and play 3D Land for this video, I was very skeptical. I mean, sure I grew up with this game and remembered loving it to death, but it had been almost four years since I properly sat down and played through it. What if it didn't live up to how I perceived it when I was younger? To my surprise though, I was so wrong to be skeptical about this game. Everything from 1-1 to the final Bowser fight is so cleverly crafted and well thought out that I almost feel bad for forgetting about it for a few years. If you've never played this game before, I really hope this video has convinced you to at least try it. Not only is this one of the best 3DS games, it's one of the best Mario games. I can confidently say without a doubt in the world that Super Mario 3D Land is an absolute masterpiece. Super Mario 3D World. It combines my two favorite things into one, Mario and the world. Oh my god. 
Initially released in North America on November 21st, 2013 for the Wii U, and on February 12th, 2021 for the Switch, Super Mario 3D World sees Mario embark on his next 3D adventure, this time adventuring to the Sprixie Kingdom. I remember getting this for Christmas in 2013 and absolutely loving it, but when I went online to see what people thought, people weren't nearly as excited about the game as I was. I mean, they didn't hate it. Five reasons why Super Mario 3D Land 2 sucks. Uh oh, okay. I don't know why, but I remember seeing a lot of negative things about this game when it came out. And looking back, yeah, I can absolutely see why this game received criticism. I mean, this game is so much easier to appreciate now that we have Odyssey and Bowser's Fury, but when it came out, it really seemed like 3D Mario was losing the freedom and openness that was so prevalent in 64 and Sunshine. Galaxy 1 and 2 were way more linear than the games before it, and 3D World became even more linear. And before its release, this game was receiving backlash as well. A lot of people were expecting the first HD 3D Mario to be this crazy huge open world adventure reminiscent of 64 and Sunshine, but instead, we were greeted to this during its reveal. What the fuck? The marketing of this game didn't do it justice at all either. This game came out during the time of Nintendo's awful, and I mean absolutely awful commercial marketing era. Hi buddy popcorn, that's a deal! All of this, the backlash from the original trailer, the awful marketing, and the mixed reviews at launch, combined to create a game that people surprisingly look back on as one of Nintendo's best games. And there's a good reason for that. This game is incredible! First off, there's the big selling point of this game, 4 player co-op. Now I haven't really ever fully played through this game with 3 other people, but the times I've played with friends, this game has been an absolute blast. And with the Switch port's online multiplayer, this is easier than ever. The levels are built around multiplayer and single player really well too. They're open enough for multiple people to explore, but also closed in enough so that if you're playing single player, it doesn't feel too empty and bland, which is something I think the new Super Mario Bros series could definitely learn from this game. I feel a good amount of the new Super Mario Bros. series levels are really bland and empty for single player because the game was built around multiple people playing, and 3D World shows that this issue can easily be fixed. And while on the topic of multiplayer, let's talk about the characters. You can play as Toad. Oh yeah, there's also like Peach, Luigi, and Mario. Each character has their own unique attributes which make them different from the others. The original cast, Mario, Luigi, Toad, and Peach, all take their attributes from Super Mario Bros. 2, with Mario not really having anything special other than being all around in every stat, Luigi having ridiculous jump height, Toad being able to run incredibly fast, and Peach being able to float after a jump. But wait, there's another character. A secret character that you can only unlock in the post game. That's right, it's none other than Waluigi, baby! Okay, no, that, that's a mod. It's actually just Rosalina. She has like a cool spin thing she does from like Mario Galaxy. It's, it's kind of cool, I guess. The game starts off with Mario and the gang attending the Star Festival. Okay, really? We're really doing this again? Three games in a row, Nintendo! Anyway, while walking around, they find this broken clear pipe and Mario and Luigi fix it up using their plumbing skills. Then this weird fairy thing jumps out and starts speaking in picture language. Then Bowser comes out and is all like, Wah ha ha, get in my jar! Then Bowser leaves, somehow fitting through that clear pipe and Mario and Everett try to go and save them. After that crazy opening, the player is able to roam around the world map. And what's cool about this world map is that it's actually fully explorable and has little secrets hidden all around it. I really like this addition because it provides a much needed change from the boring and uninspired world maps of the 2D Mario games and even 3D Land. Jumping into the first level, see what I did there? It becomes extremely apparent the art style this game is going for. A very cartoony and plasticky style, and this suits the game perfectly. Unlike the Galaxy games before, which had a serious tone that thrived with its more realistic art style, 3D World is able to thrive with its art style due to its friendly and happy nature. I mean, look at the Goombas in this game! And while on the topic of the Cat Goombas, let's talk about the new power-ups of this game. Of course, starting off with... The Super Bell. This power-up turns Mario, and well, anyone who touches it, into a cat. Toad can finally live out his lifelong dream of being a furry. With their newfound cat abilities, the player is now able to climb up walls, scratch enemies, and dive. 
There's also an alternative version of this power-up called the Lucky Bell, which is literally the exact same power-up, except when you ground pound, you make money. The other new power-up in this game is the Double Cherry. This power-up makes a copy of the player that they somehow have to control and manage with. Now, the backstory of this power-up is actually really cool. It was never planned to be in the game, but when a developer accidentally created two Marios with the cloning tools, the other developers thought it was a cool idea and just kind of ran with it. And I'm so glad they did. This power-up is used super well in the few levels it's in, and I would love to see it return in a future Mario game. Alright, now it's time to talk about where this game, and well, every 3D Mario game shines. The levels. And right off the bat, I'm just gonna go out and say it. The levels in this game are the most creative levels in the entire 3D Mario series. And without mentioning castle levels, I want to talk about some of my absolute favorites of this game. 2-3, Shadow Play Alley. Just by the title of this level alone, you should already know the gimmick of this level. Shadows. No, not the hedgehog. In this stage, a bright light illuminates the stage and creates shadows of things in the foreground and background. For instance, the first green star of this level is hinted to the player with the use of a shadow, indicating that it's in the foreground. I absolutely love this idea. Later on in the level, you enter an area where all you can see is the shadows of everything, and the player has to navigate through this finding secrets by ground pounding and rolling into things as you aren't able to tell what they are due to the lack of colors. One thing I really love is at the end of this level. In this secluded area, we see Captain Toad afraid of what seems to be the shadow of Bowser, but it's just cardboard Bowser. I love this because it shows the creativity Nintendo had when making this level, and just entire game in general. 3-4. Pretty Plaza Panic. This level is all about working on a time limit. From the second you start the level, you realize you only have 100 seconds to make it to the goal, and that doesn't give the player as long as they may like to look for green stars, stamps, and other secrets. The time limit keeps players on their toes while also promoting some exploration. To me, the time limit encourages repeat playthroughs of the level to see what you can get done on that try, or, on the other hand, challenges players to see what they can collect in a single try. 3-6. Mount Must Dash Obviously being inspired by the Mario Kart games, in this level the player must dash to the finish line. I'm funny. I know. Subscribe today. Jokes aside, this level is honestly extremely cool. I love the multiple paths there are to take in order to collect everything in the level, and just the fact that they made a Mario Kart inspired stage. It's something you wouldn't originally expect to work in a Mario game, but it's executed very well here, and makes for a stage that's very fun to replay and try to get a good time on. 5-1 Sunshine Seaside In a game that involves mostly linear levels, this stage offers a nice break with its more open environment and collectathon based clear condition, being collecting the 5 key things in order to open the warp box. I always loved this level for some reason when I was younger, whether that be the beach setting or the more open nature, I just really like this level. I think the secrets in this level are very well hidden, and the plessy section at the end is always fun. And those are just a few levels, but I can go on and on about different levels in this game because they're just that good. There are few to no levels in this game that I believe are bland and uninspired. And hey, even if there's a level that feels bland, at least the soundtrack will still bang. Oh yeah, that reminds me. Oh. My. God. The music goes so hard in this game. This is probably my favorite 3D Mario OST of all time. Yes, even above Galaxy. I know. I know. But man, this music goes hard. The music of this game is all performed by a live orchestra, with a lot of the songs being either rock or jazz, and I really think the music composed for this game fits it well. There's even remixes and recreations of old tracks from previous Mario games, like the slots theme being a recreation of the character selection screen from the HIT Game of the Year title Super Mario Bros. 2. Doesn't this music make you want to gamble your life savings away? The music of this game is just incredible. I can't stress that enough. Each level feels like it's built around the music, with some levels flat out being built around it, and really helps set the tone and atmosphere for the player while they're playing. I didn't forget about him. Captain Toad Originally introduced in Super Mario Galaxy, makes his first playable appearance in this game. As him, you play in these small, condensed, little areas where you have to navigate around and collect all the green stars. 
But what's cool about the Captain Toad levels is that you have limited movement options as Captain Toad is unable to jump, which forces the player to find unique ways to move around and traverse. And Nintendo apparently loved this gameplay so much, they decided to make it into its own game, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, which is an absolute blast to play if you haven't already. Originally, on the Wii U, you would use the gamepad to stun enemies and tap certain blocks that would move and allow Captain Toad to progress. And on the Switch port, you would either use the touchscreen of the Switch itself or the gyro inside the Pro Controller and Joy-Cons. I always love this mechanic in the Captain Toad levels of interacting in the levels like this, but I have to admit, this game barely scratches the surface of the capabilities of this feature, but also Captain Toad's level design as a whole. Now, don't get me wrong, his levels in 3D World aren't bad, but Captain Toad Treasure Tracker fully makes use of these mechanics and creates amazing levels for the player to try and solve and find every secret. And with all that out of the way, I guess it's time to involve the levels discussing the main bad guy, Bowser himself, Big Bow, the Bow Man, Turtle- The Bowser stages in this game are actually really fun in my opinion. Although there are only three of them, each of them are amazing levels. The first Bowser level of this game, Bowser's Highway Showdown, sees the player learning about Bowser's kick bombs and how to use them to their own advantage. The actual level portion of this stage is fairly small, but the real good part of this level comes at the Bowser fight itself. After climbing a set of stairs, we see Bowser pull up in his absolutely dripped out car, which I recently found out is called the Koopa Chase, but uh, I prefer to call this the Bowser Mobile. Anyway, after Bowser absolutely flexes on us with his car, he starts throwing kick bombs at the player, and in order to damage him, the player has to kick them back enough times in order to make the car explode and break the bridge under Bowser, causing him to fall. What I like about this fight is the use of the kick bombs, because if you're skilled enough, and I am, and you manage to aim them at Bowser's head and jump as you kick, you're actually able to defeat him much faster than doing it the normal way. I also just really like the idea of Bowser being in a car. I don't know why, but it's kind of funny seeing him sitting in the back of his like pimped up car throwing bombs at people. The second Bowser level, Bowser's Lava Lake Keep, is much more difficult than the first. This is obviously because it's in what the player would originally presume to be the final world. Anyway, just like the first, the actual level portion of this stage is relatively small, just reintroducing the idea of kick bombs to the player as they wouldn't have seen them much since the very first world. After progressing through the level portion, we are once again met with the stairs we saw in the highway showdown. After climbing them, we see Bowser has not only repaired, but absolutely pimped out the Bowser mobile. Look at this thing, now shining with bright neon lights that, now that I think about it, actually kind of foreshadow the next world, like the world Bowser's neon lighting scheme. Anyway, the fight is very similar to the original, but now is a lot more difficult. Instead of just throwing kick bombs and occasionally shooting fire, now Bowser will shoot out loads of fireballs that leave a mark in the ground that if the player touches, damages them. This makes kicking back the bombs a lot tougher, and the ground itself doesn't help this at all. As the fight goes on, the ground is sometimes filled with spikes that make the path the player can take become very narrow. And along with having to dodge Bowser's fireballs, this fight can be kinda hard! But after suffering through it all and defeating Bowser, we see him plummet into the lava lake below, and the player would most likely assume that they defeated Bowser, and everything's all happy and the game's over but to nobody's surprise, except for like the one guy who never played Mario before, Bowser isn't done just yet. And as the player is celebrating, and it seems like the level has come to the end, the end card is pulled away and we see Bowser trap all the fairies in a huge jar. Come on Bowser, what is with the jars? Anyway, Bowser gets away and the player is now able to travel to the true final world. World Bowser. I don't know why I said it like that. World Bowser itself is really cool, a giant Bowser themed neon lit theme park with a huge tower in the middle of it all. And after making their way through this theme park, the player is finally able to challenge the final level of the game, the Great Tower of Bowser Land. Honestly, I'm not a huge fan of this level, although I do think there are some high highlights, like real good. Notably, the Bowser Mobile has been abandoned, no! Yeah, as soon as you start the level, the game makes it apparent that you won't be fighting Bowser in his car, rather in a different way. And just like the others, the level portion of the stage is extremely short. It's not much, but it does allow the player to get some power-ups before the big fight. After making it through the level, we're now in front of Bowser's huge tower, and we see Bowser jump in front of us, ready to stop us. However, instead of going after the player right away, 
Bowser instead pulls out a super bell. And yes, I know what you're thinking. There's no way Bowser will become a furry. Oh dear god. So yeah, Bowser has now officially transformed into M Meowser. Yeah, it it's quite a name. Anyway, the player is tasked with scaling up the huge tower while being chased by Bowser. I mean, while being chased by Meowser. I honestly don't really like this bit as it's an auto-scroller and I always felt like it moved really slow, but nonetheless, it isn't too long. And after the player hits Meowser with a pal block and sends him flying off, the player can jump into a clear pipe. This part of the level is, in my opinion, the coolest. As we're going up the clear pipe, Bowser comes back chasing us, and now the player can do nothing but watch. After a short while, Bowser uses a double cherry to clone himself, and now the player has to dodge multiple Bowsers while climbing up the tower. Sadly, same as the last part, this section is also an auto-scroller, and moving is a little slow. But I really like the idea of multiple Bowsers just jumping out of the walls at you. In the final section of the level, the player has to climb a staircase spiling around the very top of the tower, while there are like 10 Bowsers trying to attack the player. I really like the music of this section as well. It honestly reminded me a lot of the Galaxy games. Anyway, after reaching the top and hitting this giant pal block three times, Bowser flies off into the sky, finally being defeated. No, no, more, no more end cards being pulled away, no more jars! He's dead. I think this level did a lot right, but also a few things wrong. I really like the whole idea of the level, the whole Meowser thing and the use of the double cherry, but the auto-scrolling of it all just slows it down. But don't get me wrong, I don't think this is a bad level or anything, I think it's pretty good for a first playthrough, but it honestly could have just been done a little bit better. <laughs> you thought the game was over? Nope! After beating the game, there are three post-game worlds with a bunch of new levels. I say new because while some of them are brand new, a lot of them are remix levels from the actual game. And I love this idea. It introduces you back to these levels you played before, but now with a bunch of new twists that make it more challenging and fun to complete. And if you really are a completionist and collect every stamp, every star, and get a golden flagpole in every single level, you will knock a final stage. Champion's Road. Champion's Road is a platforming gauntlet and is one of the hardest levels in the entire Mario series. It's often debated whether this or the Perfect Run are the hardest Mario stages. And while I personally think the Perfect Run is the hardest, this stage is a very close second and has extremely stressful moments that require almost perfect movement from the player. When I first challenged this stage, no joke, it took me like 3 hours to complete. And that's only because I devised a perfect route and I had almost basically muscle memoried the entire stage at that point due to how many attempts it took. And if I'm being completely honest, I enjoyed every second of the three hours it took. I think while it's hard, it's a stage that over time, you can find the best routes and patterns to take and it makes for a really fun course to try and master and really drives home the fact that 3D World is an amazing game. Super Mario 3D World is a game that deviates from the format we are used to with 3D Mario games but creates one that's equally fun to play and one that can even be enjoyed by up to four people at the same time. The creativity and passion put into this game is extraordinarily apparent. Each level feels unique and there are very few dull moments throughout the entire adventure. Super Mario 3D World shows that even when presented in a format we are not used to, the 3D Mario series continues to be one of the best in the entirety of gaming. Released worldwide on February 12th, 2021, Bowser's Fury is technically the 7th mainline 3D Mario game, but also not really. As you probably know, Bowser's Fury is a side mode inside of the Switch port of Super Mario 3D World. 
So it's not really its own thing, but I mean with the amount of content here, it's really hard to pass it off as just some simple extra mode. Bowser's Fury is easily the most expansive and well-crafted side mode we have ever gotten in a Wii U to Switch port. Where most Wii U ports just add a new character or some new levels to try to entice previous Wii U owners to buy the games again, 3D World adds an entire separate sub-game inside of it that has fostered a huge speedrunning community dedicated to pushing the game to its absolute limits. It's incredible. Getting into the game itself though, Bowser's Fury opens up with a very similar opening to that of 3D World. But instead of finding a clear pipe and traveling to the Sprixie Kingdom, Mario instead finds a trail of goop that leads him to what seems to be Shadow Mario's signature M graffiti from Super Mario Sunshine drawn on the ground. While inspecting this graffiti, Mario is consumed by it and transported to a mysterious new land where he crash lands in the center of a giant footprint. After getting Mario's head out of the dirt, the game gives the player some time to get familiar with the controls and make their way over to what appears to be Bowser's airship that's crash landed into the ground. Upon getting onto the airship, a giant Bowser wakes up and just starts going crazy shooting fireballs into the air and causing these giant pillars to fall out of the sky. After avoiding Bowser's mayhem and collecting the first of this game's signature collectible, the cat shine? Bowser flees away and the sky clears, revealing a giant lake that's been mostly polluted by black sludge. From the water that isn't polluted though, a giant landmass erects from the water. On this new landmass, Mario meets up with Bowser Jr. who begs for his help, telling Mario that one day Bowser randomly just got all big and mad and that he can't change him back on his own. Upon hearing Jr.'s little sob story, Mario reluctantly agrees to help Jr. and the two team up to try and save Bowser. This opening is honestly pretty good. It's not anything special, I mean there's obviously been much better 3D Mario openings, but I really liked the subtle little sunshine reference with the Shadow Mario M graffiti on the ground. And I absolutely loved how the lightning strike here illuminates Fury Bowser's silhouette before he wakes up and starts wreaking havoc. The coolest part of this game's opening though, has to be the introduction of Bowser Jr. as Mario's companion character. It's awesome to see him finally have a mainstay role in a 3D Mario game for the first time since Galaxy 2, and it's even more awesome that he's actually fully playable here. By connecting a second controller, a second player can take control of Bowser Jr. and help Mario out along his journey. Bowser Jr. can ascend and descend in the air with his clown car, hit and defeat enemies with his Super Mario Sunshine inspired paintbrush, and even reveal hidden power-ups on the wall by drawing graffiti. Apart from the game that Bowser's Fury is a side mode of, 3D World, the two-player here is easily one of the best two-player experiences in a 3D Mario game. I never really liked the co-star thing in the Galaxy games for multiplayer as it was just kind of boring, and while I liked Odyssey's multiplayer with Cappy as it let you be much more in control than with the co-star, controlling Bowser Jr. here is just so much more fun. He actually feels like a fleshed out second player who can actually be useful. Speaking of controls though, the way Mario controls in this game is actually quite interesting. You see, since Bowser's Fury is built off of 3D World's engine and is just essentially an extension of 3D World in a lot of ways, Mario actually controls exactly the same as he did in that game here. Gone is the crazy amount of depth and preciseness Mario had with his moveset in Odyssey, and returning now is Mario's much more simple moveset he had for 3D World. You don't have the double jump and triple jump anymore, and the moves you do still have like the side flip, dive, and long jump don't reach as far as they usually do and are more there as sort of a visual flair to make Mario's moveset seem more fluid than it actually is. Now while this sounds awful and makes it seem like Mario's movement here is the most limited it has ever been, there's a reason for this. The power-ups. Spread all throughout just about every area you explore in this game are a variety of different power-ups that enhance Mario's moveset and make controlling him much more fun. In Bowser's Fury, you got power-ups like the Cat Bell, Boomerang Flower, Fire Flower, and Tanuki Leaf, which all are obviously returning from 3D World. And while every single power-up here is useful in their own right, the Boomerang Flower is good for nabbing close-by collectibles, the Fire Flower is great for defeating a gang of enemies from far away, and the Tanuki Leaf is great for crossing a large gap. The power-up you'll get the most use out of here is the Cat Bell. The Cat Bell allows Mario to climb up walls, scratch at enemies to defeat them, and dive out of a jump. Cat Mario is so much fun to move around with because of all the abilities it has. Climbing up walls makes high up places much easier to reach. 
Being able to perform a simple scratch to defeat most enemies makes blasting through a certain area much easier. And being able to dive out of a jump is just as useful and fun to perform as the dive move is in other 3D Mario games like 64, Sunshine, and Odyssey. The cat suit also has minor things about it that make platforming with it feel very smooth and responsive. You got the midair scratch you can do that serves as a great midair correction tool if you need to hold your place in the air or quickly change your direction. You can chain cat dives together to make traversing long stretches of land easier. And most importantly, Mario Meow. Overall, the movement in Bowser's Fury is great. The diverse selection of power-ups here that you can select from at any time makes it so the player is always prepared for just about any situation and makes traversing this game's world an absolute blast. Speaking of this game's world though, I think it's important to note that Bowser's Fury is an entirely open world game, a first for the Mario series. Every single 3D Mario game to ever release, even counting the handheld ones like 6040S and 3D Land, has always had a hub world or hub ship in Odyssey's case that Mario has used to travel to different locations or levels. In Bowser's Fury, however, everything is all contained within one giant map, meaning that if you want to go to a certain location, you can just go there instead of having to return to a hub world and select a level and sit through a loading screen. Personally, I love this. I think Bowser's Fury is designed really well around its open world, and it doesn't feel at all forced or anything. I love just how seamless the transition to different levels are with the music kicking in right as you enter the area of a stage and fading out as you get farther away from it. There's a lot of charm to just continuously being able to play a game without being interrupted or stopped by having to sit and watch a loading screen. The absolute best part of Bowser's Fury's open world though is how the levels literally change right in front of your eyes. You see, since you obviously aren't booted out of an area when you collect a cat shen or anything, the way Bowser's Fury adds to a level or introduces a new mission is by changing the level right in front of your eyes in real time. Take Colosswipe Colosseum for example. When you first visit this place, it's a pretty small coliseum that doesn't really have much to offer in terms of size. But after completing the first mission of the area, running away from it a bit and looking back at it, you'll see a new level of the coliseum literally emerge from the ground right in front of your eyes. It's so cool. Having levels change in real time like this just makes the entire experience seamless. It feels like such an amazing compromise between Mario 64 and Sunshine's ideas of having levels change over time but requiring you to leave that level, and Odyssey's idea of having levels not change over time but never booting you out. The idea is so cleverly executed here, and I really hope it's what we see going forward in future 3D Mario games. Moving on though, I wanted to talk about something I noticed a lot when playing this game back for this video. And that's how this game reuses, but also remixes a lot of ideas and aspects from 3D World. Obviously it's not a surprise at all that the game would do this, but I absolutely love the way it does this. For example, in 3D World there were sometimes enemies on the world map that would block your path that you're rewarded with a green star for defeating. These enemy fights would take place in a small arena-like area that you couldn't get out of, and offered a pretty cool way to get green stars. And in Bowser's Fury, spread throughout the map there are a few purple buttons placed in random locations. Upon hitting one of these buttons and activating it, a bunch of enemies will appear, and Mario will be trapped in a small arena-like area that he can't get out of until he either dies or defeats all the enemies. If you do manage to defeat all these enemies though, you're rewarded with a cat shine similar to how you're rewarded with a green star in 3D World. I absolutely love this. It's such a cool way to translate one of 3D World's ideas into an open world environment, and certainly not the only example of this. As I briefly mentioned earlier, each level in Bowser's Fury has a set of missions to complete. But what I didn't mention is that a ton of missions and sometimes even just levels in general here actually take direct inspiration from concepts seen in 3D World's levels. Take for instance the mission Feasting on Fuzzies on Risky Whisker Isle. This mission sees the player making use of a piranha plant that they can hold to eat up some fuzzies. After eating up all the fuzzies, the player is awarded with a cat shine. This concept of eating up fuzzies with a piranha plant is directly taken from the level Shadow Play Alley in 3D World, where the player, over the course of the entire level, uses a piranha plant to clear the path of fuzzies. And it's not like the game is just straight up stealing these ideas, it's adding something to those ideas and building off of them. Just look at the mission atop Mount Magmeow in another level. This mission has the player scaling up a mountain using switchboards. 
and while on these switchboards, the player has to avoid these enemies called fuzzlers, and hit switches that change the direction of the switchboard's track. And while this concept is derived from the level Switchboard Falls in 3D World, where the player does exactly that, in Bowser's Fury, the idea is used in a completely new way. It's used as a means of making scaling this giant mountain even more challenging than it already was. Which is just so cool. The last example I wanted to mention of this idea of remixing and translating 3D World's concepts can actually be seen in an entire level of Bowser's Fury. That level is Pipe Path Tower. Pipe Path Tower is all about clear pipes. Throughout almost every mission here, you're trying to choose the correct clear pipe path to make your way to the top. And in one, you're trying to clear the pipes of these dangerous spikes. This whole clear pipe gimmick obviously comes from them being a major part of 3D World, but the way they utilize here is specifically derived from 3D World's clear pipe cruise. Which is all about, you guessed it, taking the correct clear pipe path and clearing them of spikes. Overall, Bowser's Fury does an incredible job at taking ideas from 3D World, remixing them, and translating them into an open world environment to make them feel fresh. I will always appreciate just how much Bowser's Fury pays homage to 3D World with its level design. With pretty much every single other aspect of this game out of the way, I think it's time we talk about the big man himself, Bowser. Throughout almost every single second you play this game, looming in the background at the very center of the map lies Fury Bowser. As time passes, you'll start to notice that Fury Bowser becomes less of a giant blob sticking out of the ground, and more of a huge giant shell that's ascending into the air. After enough time has passed, Bowser's shell will turn orange and it will start raining everywhere on the map, regardless of where you are. And very soon after that, the sky will turn to a hellish orange color and Fury Bowser will start roaming free. When Fury Bowser comes out, the entire tone of the game completely changes. You go from listening to happy Mario music and jumping around with the beautiful blue sky in the background, to listening to heavy metal while running for your life while one of the scariest, but easily the coolest renditions of Bowser chases you around, breathing fire, causing pillars to fall from the sky, and just causing absolute mayhem. I absolutely love how Fury Bowser happens in real time. It's just like one minute everything's quiet and peaceful, the next, hell. The only real issue I have with Fury Bowser sequences, and really the only issue I have with the game in general, is that sometimes Fury Bowser can happen when you absolutely don't want it to happen. I get it's a part of the game, but it feels a little excessive at times. Especially in the post game when you're just trying to collect the rest of the shines. Moving on though, without a doubt the best part about Fury Bowser in this game are the fights with him. As you progress through the game, your goal is to collect enough cat shines to unlock the current area you're in's Gigabell. After collecting enough cat shines to unlock a Gigabell, the next time Fury Bowser comes out to wreak havoc, the Gigabell will awaken and Mario will be able to collect it, turning him into Giga Cat Mario. These fights with Fury Bowser are just incredible. It feels so good to grow to his size and be able to stand up to him and see the map from his perspective. And while the first fight with him is relatively simple, with each new fight, Fury Bowser starts using more and more moves and actually becomes pretty difficult to defeat at times. The last fight with him though, is easily the best of the ones in the main story. It starts off exactly the same as all the rest, just with Bowser having more health than usual. But after you defeat him, he comes back freed of the black sludge that once took over him, and now is just this giant version of regular Bowser with bright white eyes that is trying to steal the three Giga Bells. During this final sequence, you chase Bowser aboard Plessy, dodging his attacks, and ramming the stolen Gigabells into him to try to break open the crystal containing them. And after evading his attacks for long enough, you're finally able to ram the crystal of Gigabells into Bowser for the final time, defeating him and bringing an end to one of the coolest final sequences in a Mario game.
Bowser's Fury is a weird Mario game. It's an incredibly short experience, clocking in at around 3 hours to complete the main story, and about 6 hours if you go for all 100 cat shots spread around the map. Despite being so short though, Bowser's Fury honestly feels like an almost fully fleshed out Mario game. The only thing missing here is a longer runtime. The game perfectly builds off 3D World's engine, and even in some cases 3D World's ideas, and brings them into a fully open world environment that is just an absolute joy to explore. The power-ups work so well here, and being able to switch between them with the simple press of a button makes it so you're equipped for just about every situation. The level design here is amazing. It's up to the incredible standards we're used to in a 3D Mario game. The Bowser fights here, and just Fury Bowser in general, is such a far cry from what we usually expect from Bowser fights and representation, and I absolutely love that. When this game got announced, I wasn't really all too excited. I thought it would just be a simple side mode that I'd forget about a week after playing, but because of the amount of love, creativity, and passion present in this short experience, I was instantly in love with it. I really hope Nintendo uses this game as a blueprint for future Mario projects. I would love to see what would come out of this already amazing experience if it was given the amount of development time that a full 3D Mario game gets. Bowser's Fury is proof that the future of 3D Mario is brighter than ever, and I just hope that that future keeps getting brighter. Released worldwide on October 27th, 2017, Super Mario Odyssey is the sixth mainline 3D Mario game. Development for this game began all the way back in late 2013, shortly after the release of Super Mario 3D World. One of, if not the biggest focus the team had during the development of this game, was to appeal to Mario's core audience, rather than appealing to the wider, more casual audience they had been appealing to since Super Mario Galaxy's release back in 2007. To appeal to Mario's core audience, the game was designed around returning to the open-ended sandbox level design of Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine, instead of the much more linear design seen in all the other 3D Marios at the time. And in order to best captivate this core audience and make the gameplay feel as much like a return to the roots of 3D Mario as possible, many prominent developers and staff who worked on 64 and Sunshine were brought on board to work on Odyssey. But the team didn't want to entirely rely on the roots of 3D Mario. They also wanted to introduce tons of new mechanics and ideas that would keep the gameplay feeling fresh. One of the many new mechanics they messed around with in the early stages of the game's development was the capture mechanic. And after working on and refining it for a few days, they realized just how much potential it had and eventually decided to focus the entire game around it. And as the game wrapped up its decently long development period of around 4 years, Super Mario Odyssey was properly revealed to the public, title and all, on January 13th, 2017. Super Mario Odyssey opens up with a classic confrontation between Mario and Bowser aboard Bowser's airship, where Mario seems to have caught Bowser before he was able to escape whilst trying to kidnap Peach, and the two are duking it out. However, unlike most confrontations between the two, Bowser actually wins here by catching Mario off guard with his boomerang hat and sends him flying off into the air. With only his hat remaining on the ship before it's promptly disposed of by Bowser and shredded to pieces. This opening does an amazing job at setting up the fact that Bowser's going to be an actual threat this time around. Unlike whatever he had going on in 3D World. I love that when he's speaking, although a lot of it is just growling gibberish, you can actually make out when he names both Mario and Peach. After the game's opening cutscene though, rather than Mario waking and starting off in a happy and upbeat grassy plane like we've seen over and over in the Mario series, he instead wakes up in this gloomy, monochromatic place known as Bonneton, where he's greeted by Cappy your companion and partner for the game. Bonneton is a great area to start the game in. Not only is its gloomy and dark atmosphere such a well-needed change of pace from what we're used to in opening levels from Mario games, 
The dark and desolate nature of the kingdom is actually intended to reflect the feelings of Mario and the player as they begin their adventure. I mean, Mario was just defeated and has no idea where he is. So it makes sense for the emotion conveyed by this kingdom to be sadness, with the fog surrounding Bonneton representing his confusion. And after coming to grips with the basics of the controls and teaming up with Cappy, here in Bonneton, you're also introduced to the capture mechanic, with the game having you capture a frog in order to effortlessly scale the tower. I think a frog being the first capture of this game is honestly a pretty smart move. Not only is it an incredibly simple, but incredibly useful capture, just requiring you to jump to use its ability, it also showcases that you can capture almost anything in this game, not just average Mario enemies. This game is amazing. The climax of this tutorial kingdom is your introduction to the Brutals, goons who Bowser has hired to plan his wedding and take care of Mario. And although your fight with the first Brutal here, Topper, is relatively simple, I really do appreciate Nintendo designing completely new side villains here instead of reusing Boom Boom or Bowser Jr. It's just one of the many things that makes Odyssey feel distinct. And I mean, speaking of Odyssey's distinctiveness, I can't forget about its incredible assortment of kingdoms. Super Mario Odyssey is meant to be an adventure. It's a globetrotting journey across the world, hence the title of Odyssey. So its kingdoms should represent that, and each one should be diverse and different from each other in order to truly make it feel like you're traveling the world. And the game absolutely delivers on this with its kingdoms. While at first, a lot of the locations in the game may seem like formulaic rehashes of basic Mario level themes, like Cascade and Sand Kingdom seeming to be just your average grass and desert levels, the kingdoms that stick to these formulaic themes all have something unique about them that set them apart from locations that have used these themes before. Cascade Kingdom has a prehistoric theme, even featuring a literal T-Rex and the fossil of a giant Triceratops. The Lake Kingdom has this Atlantis-inspired theme, with its Greek architecture and underwater city. And the Seaside Kingdom is a French-inspired beach resort, complete with a volleyball minigame. And the kingdoms that aren't based off classic Mario themes and are in fact brand new, well, those kingdoms are just amazing. Of course you have the big one, the one Nintendo promoted tirelessly up until this game's launch, that they even created a live-action music video for, the Metro Kingdom, which I'll talk a lot more about later. But you also have Bowser's Kingdom, a beautiful traditional Japanese-inspired take on the Koopa's Castle, the Luncheon Kingdom, which combines a volcano theme with a food theme to create this colorful and weirdly upbeat location inhabited by living forks. And finally, Crumble Den, aka the Ruin Kingdom, which is like this Dark Souls-esque location that features this incredibly cool boss fight against a giant dragon referred to as the Lord of Lightning, that I desperately wish got fully realized into an entire kingdom due to how original and cool its design is. But Odyssey's kingdoms aren't just fun to look at due to their unique theming. They're also an absolute blast to explore thanks to this game's legendary movement. Super Mario Odyssey without a doubt has the best movement of any 3D Mario game. There is no competition. It has basic movement options like the long jump, double and triple jump, and of course the wall jump that are more than enough for inexperienced players to make their way through the game. But for those more experienced players who want to go a bit further with the game's movement and master it, there are a ton of other moves that when used in conjunction with each other, offer so many fun ways to overcome obstacles and move around quickly. For example, inside the Sand Kingdom's inverted pyramid, as soon as you enter, you're met with a large gap and a bullet bill launcher that's shooting bullet bills at you. Now, in order to cross this gap, you could just capture a bullet and make your way across with ease, or you could say no, I don't need the bullet, and instead make your way across with clever and relatively precise usage of the movement that is just so much more fun, fast, and satisfying. It really feels like a lot of Odyssey was designed with this two solutions to the puzzle idea in mind. You have the intended path that most people will take, and whether that be through capturing a conveniently placed enemy or following the direction the game is pointing you in, and then you have the less intended path, that usually requires a decent understanding of the movement in order to pull off. I absolutely love this idea. On my first playthrough of the game, I didn't really understand Mario's movement all that well, so I usually stuck to the intended path. 
But on every subsequent replay I do of this game, I'm always finding new and unique ways to tackle challenges because of how well-rounded I've become with Mario's movement and physics. And the game doesn't just reward your understanding of the movement with quicker paths. It also rewards you for going out of your way to reach certain areas that may seem inaccessible at first. One of the best examples of this can be found in the giant room under Toast Arena, where the binding band used to be held. Here, there are pillars surrounding you, that at first just seem like simple set pieces to decorate the room. But if you try to reach these pillars by making clever use of Cappy, you'll actually be rewarded by sets of invisible coins scattered about on each of the pillars. This in and of itself is already cool, but What's more is if you take it a step further and make your way onto this small sliver of rock outlining the door, and perform a well-timed cap jump to make your way on top of the doorway, you'll actually be rewarded with a giant stack of 200 coins just because you were curious enough to try to get up there. And in Bowser's Kingdom, right below the area where Bowser takes off in his airship with Peach, there's a giant Bowser head that, similar to the pillars in Toast Arena, just seems like a decoration at first, but is actually somewhere you can get to by literally jumping down from above and angling yourself so you don't fall off. Here, you're not rewarded with coins, but rather a power moon. Meaning that not only was this area somewhere they knew you could go, but somewhere they expected you to go. And by making light of the sheer amount of movement possibilities you have in this game, and just how much effort was put into it, it may seem like Mario's movement is the forefront of this game, its main draw. But it's actually not, and that's the beauty of it. The main draw of Odyssey, and its main focus, is the captures, having the ability to be almost anything. So the fact that Nintendo put this much effort into Mario's movement, and the fact that it controls so well, is just a testament to how polished Odyssey is, and how much love was put into it. This game truly encapsulates the beauty of the original Sandbox 3D Mario's 64 and Sunshine by offering open levels and stellar movement, but also expands upon them with so many new ideas. One of the many new ideas Odyssey introduces is the purple coins. Now, the concept of actual purple colored coins in Mario games isn't new, we already saw them in Super Mario Galaxy, but their usage and purpose here is completely new and different. In Odyssey, the purple coins are an actual currency you use, separate from the regular coins you collect, that can be used to buy souvenirs and costumes from a clothing franchise called Crazy Cap, but can only be used in the specific kingdom you collected them in. The main gimmick with the purple coins is that there's only a set amount of them in each major kingdom, with the goal being to find them all and be able to buy everything in each kingdom's purple coin shop. Now, in concept, I think the purple coins are an amazing idea. It's just another way Odyssey incentivizes exploration of its open sandbox levels. But in execution, this idea isn't without its problems. A lot of the time when you're trying to collect an entire set of a kingdom's purple coins, you'll always be stuck on one or two pairs you can't seem to find, despite you searching up and down every area tirelessly only to finally cave in and look up a tutorial online to find that they were hidden in the stupidest place possible. Like, just look at this set of purple coins in the Snow Kingdom. You literally have to jump into a hole in the ground that seemingly would kill you, but instead has a place you can land in to collect the coins. Holes in the ground usually mean death. This was a concept that has been literally burned into Mario players' heads since World 1-1 in Super Mario Bros. So, why they decided to hide a pair of purple coins here is beyond me. Now, I don't think the solution to the purple coins' issues is to remove them outright. They are a really good idea, just plagued with some awful spots that they're hidden in that can turn a lot of players off from wanting to find them. The real way to fix purple coins is obvious. Either don't hide them in absurd spots, or allow the player to buy hints slash arrows that point them in the right direction without fully giving up their location. Overall, I really like the purple coins. They are a genuinely cool new idea, I just wish they weren't annoying to collect at times. But my absolute favorite new idea introduced in Odyssey is very unsurprisingly the capture mechanic. It's hard, for me at least, to fully appreciate the capture mechanic as much as I did when the game first came out, just because of how used to it I am, because of how much I've played Odyssey now. But on my first playthrough of the game, I remember having an absolute blast just throwing my hat at anything that looked capturable and seeing what new powers they gave me. I mean, the fact that you can capture literally almost anything, 
yes, I mean anything, is just such a genius idea that allows for limitless possibilities. And while some of the captures in the game, like the meat or the boulder, may seem underwhelming and are more there as sort of a joke capture to make you laugh a bit, the ones with actual effort put into them, which is like 90% of them, are done remarkably well. And it's not like the game overuses certain captures and is rarely introducing new ones. It's always moving on to the next thing before you can even fully understand the last one's abilities. And despite there being over 50 things to capture in the game, Odyssey feels like it barely scratches the surface of this mechanic's potential. These captures aren't just one-off things to solve a puzzle that become useless right after either. They open so many possibilities within levels, so many different ways to traverse around, and are, for the most part, so unique from one another. The fact that within the first hour of this game, you can be a frog, an electrical wire, a chain chomp, a T-Rex, a pair of binoculars, a bullet bill, a Goomba, and a cactus, just shows the beauty of this mechanic and how many ideas it throws at you in such a short period of time. Even if we don't ever get an Odyssey 2, I really hope this mechanic returns in some shape or form. Nintendo could do so much with it. And all of this. The movement, the purple coins, the capture mechanic, the creativity. It all culminates together in the absolute pinnacle of Super Mario Odyssey. New Donk City. New Donk City is one of my favorite locations in any Mario game. There is so much to do here. You have its main mission, which first involves visiting the location during a thunderstorm and scaling the city hall to defeat the giant Mecha Wiggler who's been sucking the power from the city. Then you're recruiting band members for Pauline's Festival, investigating the sewers of New Donk City, and finally taking place in the festival, which is still one of the coolest moments in any Mario game. But, you also have everything outside of the main mission. I mean, you have an entire city to explore here. You can jump off cars, swing off streetlights, race an RC car, jump rope, and even play through a remake of Super Mario Bros. 1-1 in the theater. I can see why Nintendo was tirelessly promoting this up until the game's launch. There is just so much content, so many ideas crammed into this one level. And the little things, like sitting down next to this guy on a bench and getting a moon for it as he appreciates your company, or the various Donkey Kong references spread all over due to the city's connection with Donkey Kong and Pauline, just fills the place with life and really makes it capture the essence and craziness of the city it's inspired by, New York City. New Donk City isn't the pinnacle of Super Mario Odyssey just because of what it introduces. It's the pinnacle of Super Mario Odyssey because of how it takes advantage of everything the game has shown you thus far and combines it all together in this beautiful amalgamation of creativity and love. I will never not love opening the game just to jump around here. It truly is a masterpiece of a kingdom. Despite the overwhelming amount of praise Odyssey got and still receives today, there is one critique almost everyone has about this game and that's the moon system. One of the biggest things Odyssey did to streamline its open-ended sandbox gameplay was remove the boot-out system that plagued 64 and Sunshine, and instead allowed players to just keep adventuring after they had found a moon, with the obvious exception of multi-moons. This was obviously a great change, one of the best to the Mario sandbox formula, but with moons not kicking you out of a level, Nintendo was able to place way more around than they would in the old games. Instead of a level having 7 or 8 stars or shines to collect, now stages had between 40 to almost 90 moons in them. Some of these moons are in well-crafted sub-areas or just good hiding places, while others are just… kinda there. A lot of people believe the reason for these out in the open moons existing in the first place was because Nintendo wanted you to just be able to pick up the game and play for 5 minutes and be able to collect a moon since the Switch is portable and all. And while these out in the open moons have never really bothered me, I can absolutely see why people are annoyed at how lazy it feels like some of the game's moons were placed. I think there is a lot of good to come out of Odyssey's moon system though. I mean, outside of the exploration it encourages, you also have the sub areas. The sub areas, especially in the post game, is one of the most underrated aspects of Super Mario Odyssey. The game has tons of them spread all throughout each kingdom, with every one containing a fun challenge that takes advantage of one of the game's mechanics. And whether that be a capture, Mario's movement, or sheep, 
They are, for the most part, a ton of fun and really creative at times. Outside of the main moon each sub-area has, there is also a secret second moon that is usually found by completing a harder challenge or searching around the place. I've always enjoyed the sub-areas in this game. They're what I look forward to whenever I get to the post-game just because of how creative a lot of them get. Finally though, before I talk about Bowser, there's one last thing I want to mention, and that's the costumes. I remember when Nintendo first revealed costumes for this game, my and a lot of others' reactions to the news was just, oh, okay, that's pretty cool, but I'm probably just gonna stick to Mario's regular outfit. But when the game came out, I couldn't stop wearing different costumes due to how silly or cool a lot of them were. There's just some novelty to dressing Mario up in a cowboy hat, or clown suit, or football outfit, or nothing, and just running around and playing the game that way. Each major kingdom also has a purple coin outfit that dresses Mario in the appropriate clothing so he fits in wherever he's exploring. One of my favorite things about Odyssey's costumes though, is the references a lot of them hold, and just how deep some of these references go. For example, in New Donk City, you can buy the Builder outfit, which is an obvious reference to Mario's appearance in Super Mario Maker. However, in the Wooded Kingdom, you can buy the Scientist outfit, which at first looks like a completely new look for Mario, but is actually a deep cut reference to Mario's appearance in a 1994 Japanese commercial for the Super Game Boy accessory. I still to this day think this is one of the coolest things. Not only does Odyssey allow you to dress Mario up and have him run around in absurd outfits, the outfits themselves are callbacks to Mario's past that really make this game feel like a celebration of Mario. More on that later though. For now, let's talk about Bowser. In Super Mario Galaxy, Bowser was the most threatening he had ever been. I absolutely loved it. The way he crashed the Star Festival, ripped Peach's castle up from the ground, lifted it into space, and how menacing he felt whenever you interacted with him, just made Bowser feel like a real villain that you had actual motivation to defeat, and not a dad who was trying to have a pool party with his son. In the next game, Super Mario Galaxy 2, Bowser retained some of the things that made him feel threatening in Galaxy 1, but just didn't have the same vibe. Largely due to how much Galaxy 2 sacrificed its story and atmosphere for better gameplay. And then in 3D World, Bowser just felt goofy. I mean, yeah, it obviously fit in and worked for 3D World, but Bowser has always been at his best when he's felt like an actual threat. It's what makes finally defeating him feel so satisfying. And when I say Odyssey delivers on making Bowser feel like a threat, I mean it delivers! Your first confrontation with Bowser after he sent you flying into the air and shredded your hat into pieces takes place in the Cloud Kingdom when you catch up with his airship. Here you battle atop the clouds, dodging the attacks he sends your way, and literally beating him up with the hat he defeated you with at the beginning of the game. If you're playing with Joy-Cons, you have the option to physically punch with them in order to deal damage to Bowser, which I've always thought was a cool little addition. After you defeat Bowser here and send him flying away, only for him to land back on his ship, he commands his cannons to fire at you. And while Mario is able to narrowly avoid a lot of them, before he's able to take off in the Odyssey, it gets hit and is destroyed by Bowser, sending Mario and Cappy plummeting down to the Lost Kingdom where you have to repair it. Your next confrontation with Bowser takes place a lot later in the game, when you're on your way to Bowser's kingdom. Here, Bowser stops you while atop this giant dragon, and orders it to shoot a huge blast of purple electricity at you, in order to presumably kill Mario considering his dialogue here, and once again destroys the Odyssey, with you having to defeat that giant dragon in a boss fight in order to move on. Your final confrontation with Bowser takes place after you defeat the Mecha Brutal and fly to the moon with the Odyssey, where Bowser is planning to marry Peach. I absolutely love the quiet ambience of the moon that plays once you arrive there, and the wedding bells that chime to indicate you need to hurry up and get there to crash the wedding before Bowser is able to force Peach into marrying him. After you finally make your way up to the wedding hall, you're able to burst in and stop Bowser, only to fall right into his trap. Ha <laughs> 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 
This final fight is just like the one in Cloud Kingdom. However, this time the stakes are higher, Bowser is much angrier, and overall, the fight is a lot more difficult. You have to dodge his fire breath, the spiky balls he throws at you, and the fake hats. The music here is just phenomenal. It's one of my favorite Bowser themes ever. It captures the mood and atmosphere so well. And once you're finally able to push through and start punching him one last time, Seeing him slam into the wall and finally be defeated is so satisfying. But it's not over yet. As a final demonstration of just how imaginative and creative the Odyssey team got when developing this game, the final sequence has you capture, and play, as Bowser. In this final sequence, you use Bowser's raw strength to fight your way out of the collapsing insides of the moon. You can effortlessly break walls, shoot fireballs, and jump high up in the air as the character you've gone up against for years. There's this incredibly cool 2D section that you have to go through as well, that stylizes Bowser and Peach in their original 8-bit sprites. And of course, you have the final area. The area with an entire lyrical song attached to it. This final sequence is just so cool. It makes me wish Galaxy got something like this. Shooting fireballs to destroy the pillars, and clawing out that final rock to reveal the spark pylon you need to escape, just feels absolutely marvelous every time you do it. But, like with most Mario games, the credits rolling doesn't exactly mean your adventure is over. And in Odyssey's case, it's just the beginning. Remember when I said this game feels like a celebration of Mario? Well, there's no other place in Odyssey that feels more like a celebration of Mario and his legacy than the kingdom you unlock right after you beat the game. Welcome to the Mushroom Kingdom. This entire kingdom is filled with Mario series references. And whether it be the desert far off in the distance, referencing how close a desert is to the Mushroom Kingdom because it's usually the second world in 2D Mario games, or the Tanuki Tail Tree that sits close to the castle that is an obvious callback to the exact same tree from Super Mario 3D Land, they all really bring this place to life. But there is no other Mario game that is referenced more here than the one that brought Mario to 3D in the first place. Super Mario 64. With the amount of callbacks to 64 here, the entire kingdom just feels like a beautiful love letter to that game. You got Yoshi on the castle, the jingle that plays when you drain the castle moat, jumping into paintings to rematch the bosses and hearing that iconic, the moons being retextured to stars with the classic theme playing, And of course, the entire courtyard from that game being accessible by wearing the Mario 64 outfit. It's all so cool. But the callback that really solidified my love for this kingdom is easily one of the simplest. You see, once you enter Peach's castle, you're greeted by a floor layout that is almost identical to the floor layout of the entrance from Mario 64. 
with the main thing missing being the doors to the other rooms. What's not missing though, is the sun carpet on the ground that you looked up to the roof from in order to reach the wing cap level in Mario 64. When I first reached the castle on my very first playthrough, I immediately noticed this carpet, and jokingly looked up just like I would in Mario 64, not expecting anything. But to my surprise, you are actually rewarded with a moon for this, which is just like, wow. That attention to detail is absolutely insane. The only people who would know to look up like that are people who've played Super Mario 64. So that level of acknowledgement for such a minor detail has always stuck with me. I don't care if it's just my nostalgia for Super Mario 64, I absolutely adore this kingdom. Outside of unlocking the Mushroom Kingdom though, after beating the game, you not only get more moons that repopulate every kingdom you visited, even the Cloud and Ruin kingdoms in the form of the Moon Rocks, you also unlock the ability to travel to two additional kingdoms given you have enough moons. At 250 moons overall, you get to travel to the dark side of the moon, where you have one final fight with all of the Brutals. First, you have to beat them all in a row in a boss rush, where you have the disadvantage of the moon gravity and the inability to gain health, meaning you can die incredibly easily here and have to start from the very beginning. Secondly, and finally, you have to face off against the Mecha Brutal again, however this time in moon gravity. And while the moon gravity may seem like it makes it harder, and was probably intended to do so, it actually makes it so you can easily get on top of the Mecha Brutal and defeat it in a much less difficult, but way more fun way. At 500 moons overall though, you gain access to the darker side of the moon. Yes I know, very original naming. Here you take on what I can only describe as this game's perfect run slash champion's road equivalent. There are multiple sections that each force you to demonstrate a particular skill or set of skills you've learned along your journey. This level is difficult overall, but gets really hard at the end, and due to its length, having to start over is incredibly frustrating. And while it's not as hard as Champion's Road or The Perfect Run, mostly because of how much more control you have over Mario compared to those games, this is still a very hard challenge for even the most experienced of players. And after you're finally able to complete it, you get to scale up a replica of the New Donk City Hall, while Cappy reflects on the journey you two have had in a music box rendition of the game's main theme plays, bringing an emotional end to an absolutely beautiful game. Super Mario Odyssey is an absolute masterpiece of an experience, start to finish, first playthrough to fourth playthrough, and first speedrun attempt to 50th. This game took the foundation that 64 set and Sunshine built upon, and improved upon it in the best ways possible. You're not booted out of a level anymore, you have more incentive to explore than ever thanks to the abundance of moons and purple coins to collect, and level themes are better than ever. The movement is on another level, and is by far the best movement any Mario game, hell, any platformer has ever had. It's not overcomplicated at first glance, so it's easily approachable to newcomers. But when you actually take the time to dig deep and understand it, you realize all the possibilities it opens up, and just how much you can do with it despite it not being the game's central focus. The actual central focus of the game, the capture mechanic, is one of the coolest mechanics in any Nintendo game. The team understood the possibilities allowed for, and gave us so many things to capture. But at the same time, it feels like there could be so much more due to how unique the idea is. Super Mario Odyssey is a game I fell in love with when it came out. It's a game that's always surprising you, always exceeding your expectations, and always reminding you that Mario will forever be one of the greatest franchises to ever grace gaming. Super Mario Odyssey is an absolute masterpiece. Gonna start.